by the way, yeah, that's my first one. Yeah. Which one's mine? This one. This one. In here. Good morning, everybody. I want to call the June 21st, 2023 meeting of the State Election Board to order. Uh, we will begin with our invocation, which will be given by uh, Mr. Lindsay. Dear God, uh, we ask today uh, for uh, patience and for uh, wisdom and for um, understanding and compassion. Uh, let us remember the rule of law, but also remember uh, the acts that are called for regarding mercy. In your name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Now, Andrew McMillan, who is here, would you please come up? Um, You know, as I announced uh, yesterday on July 1st of this year, which is, since I've lost track of time, just a few days away, uh, pursuant to Senate Bill 222, the State Election Board becomes an independent agency. Uh, and one of the things that we've done in anticipation of that, we have authority uh, to hire an executive director, and that's in the process. We have the authority to hire uh, two investigators, and, and that will be in the process. But I've also thought about what sort of support do we need and where can we get it as we begin to consider what our responsibilities are under this, uh, on this, this new status that we have. Well, one of which is because I don't have authority to hire a lawyer, <clears throat> although it's, it's not like we don't have enough lawyers on the board, but sometimes you just need somebody uh, in, in an outside capacity to help us understand what our obligations are and what our obligations are not and what we can do and what we can't do. So for a, a few semesters, I've been making professionalism presentations at Georgia State, and one of the things that they, it's kind of awkward standing up there, isn't it? But this is all about you, so I'm bear right with it. it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we also need a little humor every now and then. Uh, but one of the things that I have talked to Professor Lawler about at Georgia State is her desire to introduce lawyers to paths of practice other than just going into, into a law firm and practicing law, and whether it's a big firm or a small firm. But she's very interested in at least giving exposure to students who are interested, the opportunity to see how public service is different. In my life, public service, I can tell you, is very different than being in private practice. And so I asked her if she, if there might be somebody interested in their school, who's a law student, to serve as an intern um, for the state election board. And she identified one of her top students who is standing behind me. His name is Andrew McMillan. And so Andrew, I wanna welcome you to the team and thank you very much for your willingness to fit this in with your other activities. Um, and know how important it is from us to you to have your services. So thank you very much. And so I have asked Andrew to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you'll all stand, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the flag of the United States of America and into the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I do want to take up just two uh, matters which are not on the agenda, but one of which came up yesterday and the other of which actually came up in the afternoon yesterday with respect to our processing of complaints. The first is, in the morning when we were considering the Fulton County performance re uh, re uh, report, one of the things that we discussed with Fulton County was would they be willing to partner with the State Election Board uh, in trying to come up with a template of things 
which ought to be evaluated periodically in each of the counties uh, as a way of a allowing counties collectively with large counties and small counties uh, to develop what it is that's most important, what it is that ought to be assessed from, a, from an operational performance standard periodically. And while that whole idea has not been fleshed out, I've gotten a couple of emails from people who were in the counties uh, that have emailed me having watched this yesterday and said that they had never thought of an idea like I proposed yesterday and that the board endorses uh, and that they, and they are look forward to what we're going to do. Uh, what I would like, because Fulton County, including their new chair, Ms. Uh, Perkins Hooker, in a conversation when she left yesterday, told me that she was committed to helping and wanted to participate. Uh, with, with that um, expression, I wanted to ask anybody, especially the county people that are watching this or listening to it, that if there is anybody who would be interested in, in talking to us about being member of a working group uh, to work with Fulton County and others that have expressed an interest in being part of that initiative. If they would please email Alex Harden, uh, Alex, who is our paralegal, she will accumulate those names and we'll see who's interested and try to get that group organized quickly. The, the second issue procedurally is that yesterday uh, we considered a complaint having to do with mismatched uh, documents uh, and ballots and applications concerning Denise Cobb. Uh, during the course of that, there was some confusion, including on my part, whether we had passed, uh, whether we had passed a resolution in which or, or, or voted on a disposition of that by finding a violation, but instructing the, uh, a letter of instruction be given. And then as we went through some other ones individually, we realized that we, we really needed to uh, maybe do them as a group because there were so many so similar. So, we, so another motion was presented in which Ms. Cobb, having already voted on something on the complaint against her, was included. So we have Ms. Cobb now is the, uh, is the person who now is dealing with two inconsistent votes of the board and, and we need to procedurally correct that. Uh, I'll note that Ms. Cobb apparently left uh, because she thought that we had voted on her complaint, so it, uh, I think she had every right to leave thinking that that was done and then something happened when she wasn't here. So here, here are our options for the board and I'll ask what they would like to do. Uh, if we decide that the board wants to, instead of giving her a letter of instruction, referring her case to the Attorney General's office, the matter that was taken up when she was not here, uh, we will have to uh, put her, give her another notice of the complaint that she is a respondent in the complaint and that she has a right to appear at the next meeting uh, in order to respond to the complaint again so that we can decide what we should do. If we elect not to do that, we'll need a motion saying that the, mo that the motion that included her for referral to the Attorney General's office, that, that she be removed from that motion, in which case the action that we initially take it, which was to find a violation and send a letter of recommendation, a letter of instruction would stand and that's the course that we would take. Let me check with our lawyer to make sure I've explained that adequately. Okay. So what would the board like to do? Mr. Chairman, um, in the interest of fairness, uh, I believe that we need to, uh, I need to make a motion to reconsider uh, uh, the decision regarding Ms. Cobb to refer that to the Attorney General at this time and ask for the board's approval and ask for the board's approval as to that and then I would make a motion uh, to continue. I, the problem is that the evidence was inconsistent, her testimony was inconsistent with the documentary evidence that I think warrants further investigation. Um, but in the interest of fairness, to allow her to come and, and explain herself again before we make a final determination, um, I think it's important. 
So for that reason, Mr. Chairman, at this time, I would move to reconsider uh, Ms. Cobb's, the decision to refer Ms. Cobb's uh, case to the Attorney General. And, and that we then put that on, give her notice of the reconsideration and the complaint, and that they, we will hear from her again. Yeah, I mean, we, I don't, if we can do it in one motion, that's great. I was going to do it in two, but if we can do it in one, all the better, we move on to the next matter. <laughs> I think we, let's do it all in okay. one. Okay, I moved, I moved to reconsider and to, uh, to continue her case to the next uh, hearing of the State Election Board. Yeah, which, which would require, if she's on that agenda, to send yes. her new notice. Correct. The, is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded that Ms. Cobb's case be reconsidered at the next meeting of the State Election Board, that we give her notice of the reconsideration and, that, uh, and give her the opportunity to respond again uh, to the complaint that has been filed against her. Is there any discussion? Um, and for discussion, do we also need to reconsider the ruling that gave her a letter of instruction? Don't we need to reconsider that too? Let me put it this way. I move to reconsider any and all okay, got it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, determinations yesterday regarding Ms. Cobb and, and move as part of my motion to, uh, to continue her case to the next uh, state election board meeting with her per being provided with sufficient notice to appear. All right. Is there a second to that? Second. All right, is there any further discussion? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. Alex. It passes unanimously. The next order of business is a petition that's been filed with the board that has been put on for the hearing today. Um, there will be uh, two sets of uh, presentations to us. The first will be a 20-minute uh, aggregate presentation by the petitioners. There are two. One is the Coalition for Good Governance, who is represented by Marilyn Marks, and the second is a petition which is substantially similar to the petition filed by the Coalition for Good Governments, and that is a pe the petitioner in that case is Jean DeFord. At least she will be representing the petitioner in that case. So with that, I will turn the floor over to whomever of Ms. Marks and Ms. DeFord wants to speak first. Welcome. Is this microphone on? Yes. Okay, great. Good morning. Good morning, members of the State Election Board. Thank you so much for letting us speak today. Um, Ms. Dufort and I will divide the 20 minutes between us. Um, she'll be speaking for, I'll be speaking for Coalition for Good Governance. She'll be speaking for the Morgan County Democratic Committee. And um, we had planned to do this. Um, I'll spend about seven minutes, she'll spend about seven minutes, and if we could, we would like to reserve the remainder of the time to come back after your staff has presented, presented um, to answer um, anything that we feel like we need to from there. So thank you for considering well, our what, rules uh, petition today. Ex excuse me, when you first asked for time, I gave you the time of 20 minutes. So we're gonna have two 20 minute presentations and we're not gonna reserve any time. So you need to use that judiciously. Okay, thank you. So it's clear over the last year from the publicly reported events that a vulnerability and incident management reporting system, which is a mandatory system, is urgently needed when we recognize that the vulnerabilities in de that were detected and reported by Dr. Haldeman were reported to the state in the summer of 2021, yet no mitigation measures were taken or addressed for two years, even to attempt to protect the 2022 midterms. And now those vulnerabilities are public, and the state is saying that yet, still, it will not mitigate those vulnerabilities through the 2024 presidential election cycle. The vulnerabilities remain unaddressed and the risk of their exploitation greatly elevates because of the Coffee County breaches. If all of us here have learned anything from Coffee County and the breaches that occurred there, it is that there is no effective security incident reporting management system in place or mitigation system in place. 
The breaches occurred in January 2021, and the extent of them and the widespread impact is still not fully understood and not investigated. As recently as last night, the Coffee County Board of Elections met and concluded that simply terminating Misty Hampton, the then election supervisor, was sufficient. And although some of them were actually involved in the breach and were aware of the breach, that they concluded that simply terminating the person, actually not even terminating her, but allowing her to resign, separating from employment, was plenty. That's all that was required. They concluded that again last night. Yet, this was the largest voting system breach ever, uh, we ever aware of in the nation's history. So clearly that shows that there is a compelling need for a mandatory reporting system for vulnerabilities and for security incidents. And that reporting needs to come from election officials. Gabe Sterling said in his February 2022 deposition that if in fact imaging of an EMS server had actually occurred, it would require mitigation. Yet that mitigation has not been accomplished all this time later. We fast forward to November 2022. The state learned that Ms. Hampton from Coffee County had also been given access and programming rights to the voting system in Trutland County. Yet no action was taken until we at Coalition for Good Governance were able to get a few scraps of documents five months later in March. And then of course I contacted you, Judge Duffy, to let you know of that situation and you reacted promptly in getting investigators on the case. But these are situations of security incidents of the type the Secretary of State should have been notified of immediately, or perhaps was notified, but yet there were no requirements for incident reporting or to be able to address those. So what our rules do is make reporting mandatory by election officials and um, work through mitigation measures that are required when, those, when that's been reported. In recent years, the board has promulgated rules, election rules, that govern the deployment um, of the backup balloting system when the system is inoperable or it is, it is um, uh, unworkable in some way. What we're doing is asking you to expand those rules to include not just the type of physical inoperability that might occur in a power outage, but instead, not instead, but in addition to promulgate rules that expand the rules already on the books for security incidents as well. We want to be clear, we are not asking for emergency rulemaking. In fact, we think that very deliberate process needs to take place, your normal rulemaking process that would allow for public input after the proposed rules, they may need to be tweaked, are published. And in fact, I can think of some things now that um, it's months later since we first proposed these, I can think of some things that need tweaking now with the knowledge that we've gained just since we proposed these. So I want to make sure that we're clear about that. So if the board adopts these rules, we hope that they would be quickly followed by robust and complete policies and procedures that would give the election officials a step-by-step -step manual on what to do and what to do rapidly when security vulnerabilities and um, incidents occur, when vulnerabilities are, are noted and when they occur. We can step through the rules if, if you want, but in general, I think you're well aware that they that the proposed rules define vulnerabilities and define incidents and then um, require reporting on a certain rapid response timetable by the election officials. Then we step to mitigation. Mitigation uh, is required to take place for security incidents and serious security incidents such as software access, assumed software access would be a would have an immediate mitigation of going to the rules that are currently in place for the backup balloting system, handmarked paper ballots, followed by much more robust audits during the time that the security incident is being assessed and mitigated, and that before the state would return to the standard um, method of voting, 
that this board would meet in conjunction with the Secretary of State in a public hearing and determine that the mitigations were sufficient for, um, for security uh, mitigations. And that's kind of the sum and substance of what we have proposed. And we would greatly appreciate your favorable consideration and certainly the opportunity for the public to make needed refinements um, for your consideration. We'll look forward to answering any questions that you have. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Ford? Thank you, Marilyn. Good morning, my name is Jean Dufort and I'm here today on behalf of the Morgan County Democratic Committee. Last September, when videos from Coffee County were just emerging, I stood before you on behalf of a coalition of Republicans, Democrats, Libertarian candidates, organizations, and citizens asking you then to take action to protect our elections. My question that day was if not now, when? What would it take to convince you to protect our elections. Here we are nine months later, and the Secretary of State has done nothing that would protect our election from future cyber risks. Two and a half years ago, the software that powers Georgia's election system was copied, uploaded to the share file, and downloaded multiple times. It was, as Marilyn said, the largest, and I would add the most well-documented election security breach in U.S. history. Two years ago, Dr. Alex Halderman filed a report so alarming that it was promptly sealed in federal court, and that report documents specific multiple vulnerabilities that could be exploited to change outcomes. Our nation's agency, tasked with protecting critical infrastructure and election systems are critical infrastructure, uh, the DHS Department, the Cyber Security and Infrastructure Security Agency, known as CISA, because that's a mouthful, they confirmed Dr. Halderman's findings and they recommended prompt mitigations be taken. That was a year ago. The Halderman report is now unsealed and it's available to the public. Yet last month, state's attorneys told a federal judge that partial mitigations would begin in 2025, after the next presidential election. Voters can't wait. America can't wait. The path to the 2024 presidential election runs through Georgia, and it is unfathomable why anyone would refuse to protect our elections if they had the power to act. We know that some people are willing to do anything in pursuit of their preferred outcome. 2020 told us that. Secretary of State, independent from you, right, as of July 1st, clearly prefers to protect Georgia's voting system from criticism rather than to ensure our outcomes reflect the will of the voter. He's promoting, and his staff are promoting, we'll hear it in a little while, I suspect, the false narrative of the MITRE report, the false premise, they're not mentioning the false premise of the MITRE report, that the vulnerabilities, while real, can't be scaled. That's, that's what's being trumpeted. It was told to a statewide call of election officials yesterday, it's in the press release, it's in the press. Um, but the Secretary of State is choosing to overlook the footnote on page one, that MITRE's findings assume assume strict and effective controlled access to Dominion election hardware and software. Let me repeat that. The MITRE conclusion that Alex Halderman's vulnerabilities can't be scaled is dependent on the premise that we have strict controls access to that system. And whoever, whoever wrote the unsigned MITRE report must be the only person in America that hasn't watched the Coffee County videos. So members of the State Election Board, it's up to you to act. Fair, legal, and orderly elections. I don't know who wrote that, but that's the watchword on, on your website. Great, basic standard and commitment. Every one of us learned before kindergarten that there's nothing fair about a rigged game, and there's nothing fair about a rigged election. 
The election system software that powers our elections has been in the hand of partisan actors for two and a half years. We've seen their text. They have expressed intent to use it to change election outcomes, and they believe they can do it. That scares the hell out of me. My grandmother would not be happy. Our proposed rules tell local election officials that they must report security incidents and act swiftly to preserve evidence. They also commit all Georgia election officials to act first to secure the system before investigations are completed. Quite simply, you put out the fire before you call in the arson team. I've heard a lot about waiting for the GBI. Waiting for, I, I, I read your frustration with the slowness of the GBI. And I'm all for holding people accountable, but that is not the right way you deal with cyber incidents. First, first you protect the system and then you do your investigation. You can't wait until after the investigation. It's common sense and it's the standard operating procedure for companies and institutions across the world when dealing with cybersecurity risk policy. When you use electronic systems to secure your valuables, money, ID, votes, you have to have a robust plan for how to act when breaches occur or vulnerabilities are reported and it's gotta be fast. If your financial institution told you they'd found a software vulnerability that could compromise your account, and by the way, they'd also had a breach, you would close your account if they didn't also tell you what they had done to protect your funds. We all would. Since we filed this petition, I've been talking to voters across the state. Once I finish presenting, the first question is, why, why didn't we know about this risk to the 2024 election sooner? And, and then they ask, well, why isn't the state doing something or what's the state doing? And, and then they say, how can I help? Some of those people have been writing to you because that's one of my answers. Th these are the guys who can do something about it. So tell them how you feel, don't tell me. Voters across Georgia are shocked that state election officials haven't done more to protect our elections. If you refuse to adopt common sense security incident rules now, It'll be hard to explain why when our elections depend on an electronic system that has known vulnerabilities and has been compromised. Let's spend a few minutes on why protecting the ballot itself is the simplest way to protect the 2024 election, because the entire system was breached. But think about the voting process. Voters make selections, ballots are scanned, votes are tabulated, audits performed, rules are certified. Really, in the scheme of all business models, voting is not a complicated business. I ran handmade factories in India. That's, there's a little more complication in that, right? We can overcome a hack of the scanning and tabulating part of the system with robust audits, but a hack of the ballot itself is a fatal attack. Audits are meaningless if you don't have confidence the ballots you're auditing reflect the will of the voter. And the ballot created by a touch screen and a printer is the most vulnerable part of our system. One of my attorney friends calls the BMD ballot hearsay evidence that wouldn't be admissible in court because it's how the computer says you voted, not what you actually marked. And computers are vulnerable to hacking, especially in Georgia in light of the January 21 election system breach and the vulnerabilities documented by Dr. Halderman. In light of the increased risk, just inverting how we use our system. Most people who deploy the Dominion system around the country use it in a different way than we use it. In most jurisdictions, most people mark their ballots by hand and a few people use those touch screens and printers. In Georgia, we're all in on touch screens for everybody who's in person. So just invert it, use it in what I would call the standard way and everywhere else except Georgia. Right? It's a simple and effective way to greatly reduce the threat. Because if you have a ballot that you know is absolutely reliable and not vulnerable to a hack, all the rest of the possible hacks can be overcome through good audits, recounts if necessary, if you have the original will of the voter. We have a backup balloting system, Marilyn referred to it, to be used when it's impossible or impractical or unusable. It's the legislator started with that system, you and your rules defined it. Um, 
But up until now, we have mainly imagined that that's, that that's a case you use when you have power outages or you have equipment malfunction, like happened countywide in my county in November of 2020, and we switched over in every precinct quickly. 7 a.m. voters walked in, the cards wouldn't code the, the, the tablets, boom, handmark paper ballots. You know, four hours later, we, the, the Dominion Tech got there and, and made the system work again. It is not hard, and voters don't care. They just want to come in and vote and know their vote counts as cast. Um, I've talked a little bit about the why, why you should act favorably on our proposed rules today, but let's review quickly what they do. Um, adopting the rules proposal gives you, the state election board, some powerful tools you do not currently have. You can hold people accountable if they don't follow these rules. That's most of what you do, right, is hold people accountable. Um, they create a common understanding of what constitutes a serious security incident. They require immediate reporting of, reporting of any suspected security incident, and this is important. They require local election officials to preserve important evidence, like security footage. We only have the footage of, of the Coffee County breach because they preserved it for a different reason, a personnel reason, right? But we could have looked at that. Inspector Josh, who encountered Jeffrey Lenberg in January in the coffee office, could have asked to look at the video. And, and obviously concerns would have been raised much more quickly and come to your attention much more quickly. So that preservation of evidence piece is a super important part. Um, they commit investigators to act swiftly to determine whether the incident presents a likely threat. And if so determined, requires swift action to, to sideline the equipment that is the most vulnerable, those touch screens and printers. And keep it sidelined till the risk is over. Elections are our public treasure. They're the cornerstone of our democratic republic. So these rules require a public hearing where state officials can present findings and explain to the public why it's safe to resume standard operating procedure. From, from where I sit, and, and, and I'm gonna call it we, I'm, I'm a communitarian. I mean, the Morton County Democratic Committee and all the people I've been talking to in the last month, from where we sit, the single best way you can act to promote confidence that our election system produces outcomes that reflect our collective votes is to see state leaders commit to having a responsible set of rules in place to deal with security breaches swiftly and commit to enforcing those rules. Mr. Putting Gordon, it more. Excuse me. I, I, yes, sir. I, Am I out of time? You're too much like me. I sort of get wound up and lose track of time sometimes. Am I out? <clears throat> well, you're close. Okay. Uh, so if you could. I'm wrapping up. Great. I'm, I'm very you. close to the end. Today might just be another meeting day for you. Right, thank you for your service, by the way. But it's a consequential day for the voters of Georgia and the American people. The Secretary of State's office has made it abundantly clear that they will not act, despite the advice of CISA and our top experts in cybersecurity. So you alone, as an independent body, can make the choice to follow the science, follow the experts of how to manage cybersecurity risk, or punt, in which case, our 2024 elections will remain at risk. You have the power to act. The question is, do you have the will? I appeal to you for your favorable consideration of our rules. Thank you. Thank you. Your closing, your closing remarks sentence might be where I want to go next, which is, uh, and you can sit down. Go ahead. It's one thing to have power. It's another thing to have will. You can't have will unless you have the authority to do something. Uh, there hasn't been any discussion here this morning, uh, nor is there any discussion in your petition about the authority that we have under Georgia law uh, to do the things that you've requested uh, in, the, in your petition. So I've asked. Uh, because Andrew didn't have enough time to do this legal research project, but I've asked the, the Secretary of State's office not to address the decisions that they've made with respect to 2024 and the update. What I've asked them to do is simply, based upon their experience, to discuss with us legally what the board can and cannot do, in their opinion. And we have independently, as lawyers, looked at the authorities uh, before we even got uh, 
the chance to hear what they're going to present to us this morning. But I think it's important for everybody to understand uh, what the law is upon which uh, the coalition and you are requesting that we act. Uh, and you're stuck with four lawyers that, that that's on the on the board that say we always have to be cons. Uh, you know, cognizant of what we can and can't do. It's, my wife says it is that, you know, the law makes you stay in your lane uh, and we wanna stay in our lane and we can't, dis we can't really consider what's been requested until we understand what our authority is. So with that, I'm gonna ask the Secretary of State's office to make their presentation. They too only have 20 minutes. Well, I would say they too have 20 minutes, which is a long time at the Court of Appeals in the 11th Circuit, you only get 15. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to present to you this morning. Um, and at the board's request, I am presenting the Secretary of State's position on the petition and will specifically address the chairman's question about um, what Georgia law requires and what the authority of the state election board is. We did provide the board with our detailed written comments last week as the board requested. So I will use my time this morning to highlight some critical information that the board should consider when taking up the petition. Um, but the, the chairman really hit the nail on the head right now with the threshold issue, and that is what does Georgia law require? And first and foremost, the board should deny the petition because the pro proposed rules are contrary to Georgia law. The petitioners are asking the board to make sweeping changes to the state's method of voting via rulemaking. But the method of voting in the state of Georgia is a policy decision that should be made by the Georgia General Assembly and any changes to the state system of voting is a decision that the Georgia legislature should make. But let me be clear, the state's electronic voting system is safe and secure as verified by independent testing and has been proven over the past four years to produce accurate election results that Georgians can have confidence in. Our system is battle tested and the Secretary of State welcomes any opportunity to describe in detail how the state is a national leader in providing secure, fair, and accurate elections. The recent politicized attacks criticizing the security of our system are being made by those who want to sow distrust in the integrity of our elections and cast doubt on the accuracy of the results. But the Secretary of State will continue to provide secure elections, protect the security of our voting system, and any changes to the system will be done in a deliberate, informed, and responsible way. We will not be reckless with the security and integrity of our election system, especially going into a presidential year. And we will not take the drastic action of making major changes to our system and our voting software without testing it first. And any responsible actor should agree with this. But turning back to the threshold issue, the board should deny the petition because it is contrary to Georgia law. The election code mandates a uniform system of electronic voting utilizing ballot marking devices that produce verifiable and auditable paper ballots that are tabulated by optical scanners. This is an OCGA 212-300. The General Assembly um, enacted this law and made the policy decision to adopt this system of electronic voting in, in 2019 when it enacted House Bill 316. This law requires all counties in Georgia to utilize the same uniform method of electronic voting for all federal, state, and local primaries and elections. The state of Georgia made a substantial investment in purchasing new equipment for all of our counties. And this equipment has now been safely used for the past four years and in two statewide elections. The petitioners asked the board to promulgate rules that would ignore the clear statutory mandate that counties use a uniform system and give county election superintendents the discretion to use handmarked paper ballots if the superintendent determines that a security incident has occurred. However, there is no provision in the Georgia Election Code that supports the creation of such a broad exemption to the clear statutory mandate 
that all counties use a uniform system of electronic voting. And any decision to create such an exemption is a policy decision that should be made by the Georgia General Assembly. And al although state election board rules do allow election superintendents to use hand-marked paper ballots in an emergency, that is a narrowly defined situation where voting on the equipment is impossible or impracticable. In other words, when the voting equipment simply doesn't work and can't be used when voters need to be voting. The overall purpose of state election board rules is codified in the election code as to obtain uniformity in the practices and proceedings of county election officials. The petitioner's proposed rules are vague, overly broad, and likely to be interpreted and applied inconsistently between counties. This will undermine the very uniformity in election administration that the board's rules are intended to achieve. It will also require retraining of all county election officials on new procedures. And it will be confusing to voters who expect to show up in person and vote on the BMDs that they are used to. And most importantly, the relief sought by the petitioners is contrary to the express will of the Georgia General Assembly that all counties use the state's uniform system of electronic voting. And for this reason alone, the petition should be denied. But the petition should also be denied because the petitioner's security concerns are unfounded. Our voting system has been certified as safe and secure by the U.S. Election Assistance Commission and the Secretary of State. It has been through rigorous independent testing and has consistently been proven that the results the system produces are reliable and accurate. Furthermore, mandatory audits have been conducted since the statewide implementation in 2020, which affirm the integrity of our election results. These audits have provided us with confidence that our system is working as intended. And in addition to the certification process and lab testing that has confirmed the security of the system, our election processes have built-in layers of safety nets that also ensure that the results are accurate. First, there are already board rules that require strict physical security measures to protect the security of our voting equipment. Second, before any election, the equipment is subject to rigorous log logic and accuracy testing to make sure that the tabulation scanners um, are accurately reading the printed paper ballots. The paper ballots printed by the BMDs also provide the voter the ability to verify that the choices marked on the paper ballot are accurate. And fourth, risk-limiting audits confirm that the tabulated results are accurate prior to certification. And audits are now mandatory for every primary and election with state and federal races with recent legislative changes to OCGA 212-498. Um, I do want to address one part of the petition related to audits. The petitioners asked that the board promulgate a rule requiring audits for at least 50% of all races on the ballot. Um, we'll say that this is contrary to the audit requirements in the election code, but more importantly, it's simply unworkable, and it's not something that counties can practically do. It would impose significant burdens on them to be able to conduct that many audits within the certification deadline. I would also like to address the petitioner's claim that there are certain vulnerabilities in the system, um, which they identified in an expert report that was submitted in the curling litigation. Um, this particular individual is the plaintiff's paid expert witness. He was given unrestricted access to the voting equipment in a laboratory setting for 12 weeks with password information and documentation on how to uh, operate the equipment. And even with all of this access, he's only been able to identify hypothetical vulnerability scenarios rather than concrete evidence of any sort of actual attack. Um, I will, as I noted, this report was submitted in the curling litigation, and it is just one piece of evidence that is before the federal district court in that case. Uh, both the secretary and the state election board are named defendants in that case, as you're aware, and have submitted their own independent reports that thoroughly rebut the concerns <coughs> raised by, by the petitioner. Uh, for example, the MITRE report that was also recently released concludes that the proposed attacks in the plaintiff's report are operationally infeasible, meaning that they are nearly impossible for a bad actor to accomplish in a real-world setting due to the stringent safeguards that are actually in place 
at our polling locations. This includes constant observation by polling officials. And the alleged vulnerabilities were also deemed to be non-scalable in the MITRE report. And to put that in simple terms, it means that the impact of any potential attack is limited to a single device at a time. It cannot be spread to other pieces of equipment without gaining physical access. The petitioners have also pointed to the Coffee County breach as evidence of a further security risk. Let me be clear, the Secretary has strongly condemned the actions of these rogue election officials and those who aided them. We expect that those who violated the law will face the appropriate legal consequences. However, it is essential to highlight that this incident did not compromise the security of any election. We took swift action by replacing all of the equipment in Coffee County, including the server, and even the petitioner's own expert who has had a forensic image of the Coffee County equipment did not find any evidence of a malware installation. I also think it's important to note that the federal district court has had all of this evidence, a full evidentiary record that has been developed over years of litigation. And the court has taken no action to enjoin or restrict the use of Georgia's voting equipment. So I would submit that the petitioners are coming in before the board to try to achieve before the state board what they have not been able to achieve in federal litigation. Um, as I mentioned before, our election processes have a number of safety nets built in that mitigate the risk of a security threat. So it is extremely unlikely that a bad actor would be able to exploit our voting system in the real world. Uh, we would support some sort of reporting requirement as an additional safety net if this is something that the, the board is considering. Um, we would submit that any rulemaking on this issue should be done in consultation with county election officials. But looking ahead to the 2024 presidential election that is before us, I want to point out that the Secretary of State's office is taking additional steps to add even more safety nets and enhance the security of our voting system even more. First of all, we are doing system security health checks in all 159 counties to verify the integrity of our election management systems, ballot marking devices, and scanners. Our system technicians will ensure that the equipment is working as it should and has not been tampered with. We are also collaborating with the Department of Homeland Security to perform physical site security assessments of our election equipment storage and warehousing in every county. We also have worked with the legislature this past session and to get expanded pre-certification audit requirements for primaries and elections. And has been mentioned, we are also conducting a pilot of the latest version of the Dominion Democracy Suite software, which is version 5.17. This pilot will be conducted in select municipal elections, and this will allow us to select or to test the new software in a real election setting to determine if it is safe and practicable for use here in the state of Georgia. And our election experts are going to provide a briefing to the board later this morning on this new software. But let me quickly correct some misinformation that has been spreading about the software. First, the 5.17 software version is not a patch. It is a reinstallation of a new version of the software. It cannot be implemented statewide with the simple push of a button. It must be physically installed on every single piece of equipment in every county in Georgia. It will require hundreds and hundreds of man hours to accomplish this. It also has not been used in an election in any jurisdiction in the United States. We are, we are still in the evaluation and testing phase of the new software version. We will be testing it, as I mentioned, in the fall in a pilot program that will allow us to evaluate it in a real world setting so that we can certify it as safe and practicable for use as is required by Georgia law before we can use any new component of the system. And one thing that we have learned throughout this testing process and evaluation process is that the new software version is incompatible with some of our voting system components, namely our poll pads that program the voter cards that allow voters to actually use to vote on the BMDs. So had we done what the petitioners ask us to do and rush forward with an installation of the new software, we wouldn't have functioning election equipments for our fall elections, let alone for the upcoming presidential election. 
And we've talked about voter confidence. It's difficult to imagine a situation that would harm voter confidence more than if we make drastic changes that will render our equipment non-functional. So this notion that there is a simple and easy fix that will address every security risk that the secretary is just refusing to do is simply false. And again, those who are, who are pushing this want to sow distrust in our system. They're asking the state to make rash, knee-jerk decisions, which we will not do, because Georgians expect better. And the Secretary of State will not be reckless with the security and integrity of our state's voting system. We will act in a responsible, informed, and deliberative manner that ensures the security of our system in a way that is consistent with Georgia law. We know that the State Election Board shares this commitment to Georgia law and asks that you deny the petition and defer, defer to the will of the Georgia legislature and then make, let them make policy decisions regarding our election system. Thank you. Thank you. I want to take a moment to reset the, uh, what we're doing here this morning with respect to these petitions. Um, one thing that we have all learned from this experience, and we saw it play out here today, is that what we requested, that what we wanted was a discussion about the actual amendments that were being proposed, not an advocacy about shortcomings in the system. Uh, and then we wanted to know what the law allows us to do and not do. One of, the, one of the duties that we have, which, is, which I hope everybody understands, is that we have to detach rhetoric from reasoning. Our responsibility is to reason through a petition without making disparaging or, or critical remarks of the other side. We take this in a much more pure approach, which is a petition has been filed. There's specific language within the petition. We have to decide whether or not we have the authority to do so. And if we do, what does that look like and what does the process look like? Uh, a lot of what I've heard this morning, I have read in emails to me, I've read on presentations by various people in the news, and this is just not the place for that. What I want to do is I want to consider, you know, I want to consider the specific requests that have been made and our legal authority to do, the, to do that, uh, which ultimately there is, there is some of that information in the presentations that were made to us. So I want to reset that our job is to listen to these presentations and from it take the information that's necessary for us to make a reasoned and informed decision on the petitions. That we don't take sides with respect to what other, what, whatever philosophical advocacy position either anybody wants in this. Our job, as we is our mantra, which is we deal with facts and then we apply the law to the facts, and that's what I want to do now. So I hope that resets what our duties are. I've asked uh, Mr. Lindsay, my board colleague, to sort of guide us through this process with respect to the petitions with the help of, of uh, Ms. Gazelle. And so at this point, because I want to reserve whatever I have to say about this until after I hear the other board members' comments, uh, I want to turn it over to Mr. Lindsay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And if I, I think I need to turn my microphone on. And if I may sort of start off with, um, and I think it is important for, for folks to know where, where folks start from. And, you know, as someone who's been part of the election system in Georgia for about a quarter of a century, uh, as someone who was a member of a county election board, then I had my name on a ballot for several uh, election cycles. I've been a, an attorney uh, dealing with uh, election disputes and now I serve on the state election board. I firmly believe, uh, contrary to some other folks, that an electronic system is a, is a system that if properly run is both more secure and more accurate. Uh, first off regarding uh, accurate, anyone who thinks that paper ballots uh, can be um, cannot be manipulated, I suggest you read uh, Charles Bullock's excellent book on the 1948 election in Georgia for governor, in which we ended up with a dispute over three people claiming to be governor. And when it comes to the accuracy, 
of, of any kind of ballot method that involves the human uh, application of their preference versus simply touching a screen, I suggest you go and look at the 20, whether the 2000 election, presidential election in Florida, uh, which is why so many states, including Georgia, moved to an electronic system. But in order to have an electronic system, uh, you have to have a rigorous uh, process in terms of security and always maintaining that. There are two issues involved in the proposed petition uh, for rule changes. One involves reporting requirements of breaches, of any kinds of breaches. The second is uh, involved uh, what power the, the, the state election board would have when it comes to remedial action should a breach uh, take place that folks believe to be catastrophic and requiring alternative methods. And, and I believe that uh, the intent of the petitioners regarding reporting requirements has merit. I strongly believe it has merit. The, however, the specific language that is being proposed in here has some fundamental problems in terms of ambiguity and in terms of practicality and also in terms of uh, protecting that information that may be transferred to uh, this either election board or the Secretary of State should a, should a, uh, a breach or a uh, criminal activity take place that I think requires uh, some further study before we move forward with a rule change. And so while Mr. Chairman, I will be asking for a, a, a motion uh, to deny this petition, I'm gonna also uh, be making a request uh, that this uh, committee create a, a five-person uh, study committee to be come back with a, another proposed rule uh, and that take include two members of the state election board and three folks from various counties from a large county of Meadside County and a smaller county and where's my friend from Bartow County by the way I'm going to be looking for you on the second category <laughs> and someone perhaps from, from one of the four larger counties, also included in the smaller one. Because I do think that we need to try to figure out what exactly, how exactly a rule would apply so that should a situation such as Coffee County or any other kind of breach, that we have a, have a requirement for a rapid uh, uh, reporting of that and an ability to do a, a rapid investigation. I do, however, and I think that uh, one of the presenters even admit, acknowledged that there are possible changes that they would make and we would welcome their input as well. So I do have, for that reason, I think that at this time and regarding the specifics of what they propose, we should, we should turn that down, but we should also not ignore the issue involved and that we should uh, move forward with, uh, with trying to develop a rule that satisfies at least a great amount of their concerns including some of their additional input. The second part is what kind of remedial action uh, that uh, we should have and what authority we should have. I think clearly oh, we do not have the authority uh, that they are seeking within these rules. Uh, based on my analysis as an attorney and based on the analysis of other attorneys that have looked at it as well. That doesn't mean that some other activity should take place or some authority should take place. Some of that is going to require uh, legislative changes uh, in the next legislative session. And part of our duties, I will tell you right now, is to make recommendations if you look at, at our uh, ascribed duties underneath the law, is to make recommendations to the General Assembly. There's an open question as to how much authority should be given to us exclusively and how much of it should be shared with elected officials. I can tell you right now, I am hesitant to give so much authority exclusively to the state election board to, to change how we change, how we vote. I think that that probably in an emergency situation or in a situation of a, of a serious breach that we, in an upcoming election, that that responsibility should be shared. But I'm more than willing to work, and I think the board should work with the General Assembly to figure out, for instance, this is simply hypothetical whether or not an elected official such as the governor were to were to uh underneath uh it's his powers give us the authority to then take a look at it. in other words there's a certain check and balance taking place how exactly that takes place is something for us to work on between now and january but i do think that there needs to be an ability of the state should a should a um, catastrophic breach take place 
uh, that we uh, that we have that ability, but we simply this state election board simply at this time does not have it. And for that reason, Mr. Chin, I'm going to move uh, at the appropriate time that we deny this petition. But uh, but a follow up request is that uh, you put together a that we put together a committee that will first look at uh, at in terms of reporting requirements that is both secure. Uh, but also um, puts duties on the counties and is something that is workable by them because there is that concern. I, I do worry about us making rules. For that matter, I worry about the general simply making laws uh, that are simply impractical uh, when it comes to our county people being able to, to act that out. We've seen some of those problems already. And so in, anyway, Mr. Chairman, that's my report to the committee. Ms. Gazelle, would you like to speak? Just very briefly. As a matter of policy, I come, I come at this from a different perspective. Um, anybody who has, has followed my activity knows that I actually am a, a very strong supporter of paper ballots. But as a matter of law, we do not have the authority to make changes to the policies that have been set by the General Assembly. Um, the way that the General Assembly has defined the emergency circumstances by which paper ballots can be utilized is very circumscribed. Um, I, I adhere to the analysis provided by the Secretary of State. The only time that we can shift from that method is when it is physically impossible or impracticable, meaning it cannot be done. We don't have the authority to usurp what the General Assembly has decided will be the way forward. So I, uh, I agree entirely with the, with the legal analysis of my colleague, Mr. Lindsay. Mr. Bashman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. One of the things that lawyers are very familiar with that the general public is not familiar with is the idea of subject matter jurisdiction. And uh, a court will, the first um, decision that any court has to make in any case is do I have the authority over this subject matter? And, uh, and so it's a jurisdictional issue. And if the court decides that it doesn't have subject matter jurisdiction, it does not proceed any further and it doesn't even hear the merits of the case. Uh, I think the chairman here was wise to allow the parties to address the merits of the case. Um, and so, I thought that was uh, helpful. Uh, but with regard to the subject matter jurisdiction, uh, another thing uh, that makes me particularly uh, sensitive to it is that each member of the board is appointed by a different entity. There's a Democratic member of the board, or Democratic appointed member of the board. There's a Republican party member of the board, party appointed member of the board. The House gets to appoint one member of the board, and I'm appointed by the Senate. And so each, uh, while each of us and the chairman is appointed by both houses, um, the House and the Senate. Um, and so while each of us represents and works very hard to represent and hear the voices of all Georgians, we do have a particular channel that's set up by statute for us to make sure that we hear. Now I'm the only member of the board who was here um, during COVID. And so I remember distinctly um, passing the regulations that we had to pass with regard to COVID. And uh, that was an unprecedented situation that we were in. It was an emergency. We had probate judges who were election superintendents die. The courthouses were the original super spreaders. So, you know, that was a big issue and the board acted, but the General Assembly spoke after the board acted in SB 202 and the General Assembly was very clear. Um, if they weren't clear in the statute, they were clear in their communication to me that if we haven't given you specific authority to do something and it's, and it's not an emergency, um, you're, not, you're not authorized to act. Now, one of the things that we have to be very careful about on this board, uh, and we are very careful about, is the idea of the unfunded mandate. Now, everybody who's listening from a county and everybody who's here from a county knows that they hate unfunded mandates. Uh, and they hate it even when the General Assembly does it. 
So imagine a, an appointed board of five volunteers, no matter they're the, with the heart, they're the hardest working volunteers I've ever seen uh, on any committee that I've worked on. But uh, no matter how hard we work, um, we don't have the authority to pass an unfunded mandate and, and cause the counties to expend money that they don't have uh, and that we don't have any authority to give them. Uh, so we gotta be very uh, sensitive to that. Uh, and I, so I, I would be very worried uh, in that. Um, with regard to emergency, I heard the petitioners today specifically say this was not under the emergency rulemaking uh, powers of the board. And so therefore, um, now it's a question of, is, is this our job or the General Assembly's job? And so one of the, the speakers said that you, you have a choice of either act, you can either act or punt. And if you're in a debating society or deductive logic class, you, you'll note, recognize that as what's called a false dilemma and that it presents only two choices when there might be more. And just one I, I would present is follow the Constitution might be another option. And so I think the framework of the government that's set up in Georgia is this is an issue, um, regardless of how uh, good an idea it might be, this is a, a question for the General Assembly to answer and not for the board. So I will vote to oppose the petition for that reason. Dr. Johnson. Thank you. In listening to, <clears throat> to the petitioners today and to the um, Secretary of State, I have several questions to Ms. Dufort, uh, as she um, stated, protecting the ballot itself is everything. Is every ballot that leaves, my question is, is every ballot that leaves in an election office by absentee secure and protected? Aren't all hand-marked absentee ballots hackable? To Ms. Marks, I am concerned also about the amended petition that it would um, potentially create an interrupted election which would cause chaos and bedlam in the middle of one of our elections. To, <clears throat> for Ms. McGowan, Secretary of State, the claim that the state uses a uniform method of voting when one third of voters actually use hand-marked paper ballots by absentee voting, and is now and now there's an increasing number of voters that are allowed to use email voting. I question whether we are actually using a uniform method of voting. So, uh, to in the last presidential election, one third or greater than a million and a half absentee ballots were were used and um, two-thirds were um, voted by the electronic method of voting. So I think there's um, things to consider, uh, and I agree with the comments of my colleagues about the um, subject matter jurisdiction and the uh, remedies proposed. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. You know, it's interesting hearing the uh, <clears throat> comments of my colleagues, uh, which I haven't heard before. This is the first time that any of us have expressed our view of this particular statute. Uh, it's, you're hearing it as I'm hearing it. Uh, and it's interesting that I take, having thought about this before coming here, that, that, that I take a similar approach, but with a different perspective. And, and it's that perspective that that uh, makes me support that we that we do that we deny these petitions, but I want to explain why I do do what my analysis is <clears throat> as a lawyer, but also as somebody who, although only doing this for a year, have spent a fair amount of time talking to election officials in the counties, and for the first time really understanding what their job is, uh, how hard they work, and the challenges that they are presented with. Um, 
in the way that they view us, the board, and the way that they view the Secretary of State's office. As a federal judge, which I did for almost 15 years, uh, I got a lot of federal subject matter jurisdiction, by the way, is a Maybe we could turn that off. Um, uh, that there is, the notion is that we cannot do something which is contrary to a statute. Uh, nor can we do things that might not be directly contrary, but to, to pass rules that are clearly within the province of the General Assembly to pass. And I believe that that wholly applies here, that the requests made in the petition, and I have, I've focused on the petition, I'll tell you why in a second. Uh, one, requests us to do things under, that, are, that are, have already been addressed by the General Assembly, uh, and for us to act in, in a way that where we are not authorized to act would be wrong, and as a lawyer, I wouldn't do that. Um, I would, I would hate to have been in Mr. Mashburn's position when he was on the board to get a call from the General Assembly and, and told that we have our job and you have your job and your job is not to be our job. Uh, and I think as a basic principle, that's true, that we are guided by statutes that give us the space to act and denies us space not to act. In the years that I was on the court, I spent a lot of time evaluating statutes. Uh, and in a way, this rule is the same process, which is you look at the rule, especially when you're considering something that is being proposed, and in the case of a federal lawsuit is challenged. My practice always was to go without listening, without reading any brief, uh, without talking to it uh, about it with any of my clerks. I would look at the statute. And in, in looking at the statute, one of my questions would be, would I be able to understand it? And I do not understand this, especially the definitions in this statute. I find them to be extremely vague and ambiguous. Uh, and would be very, very hard to apply. Uh, that would be for me as a lawyer. To say that we would, that we would require county officials to interpret what these terms mean to determine whether or not they have some remedial responsibility, uh, I think would be uh, asking them to do something which is they're incapable of doing. Uh, and for that reason alone, it's hard to look at the rest of it because if you don't know what a security incident is, you don't want to know what a security vulnerability is. Uh, how can you then determine whether or not you have, under other um, proposed amendments, that you've got some duty uh, to act? Uh, I do agree that the, that the General Assembly, um, and we've looked at this language in the past, has, has really prescribed the incidents in which paper ballots can be used, uh, and that's, that's entrusted to supervisors within the counties in the event that there, it's either impossible or impractical to conduct an election using another system. Um, and so therefore, I think that provision in and of itself runs afoul of the statutes passed by the General Assembly. Uh, and, and therefore, it's, it would be, I think, unfair and really imprudent for us pass these amendments and impose these ambiguities and duties on people in the field. Uh, now, I'll say that after I looked at a statute, my next question always was, why is there a dispute or, or why, do, why do some people interpret a, set, a provision differently than somebody else? And that's important to me because I want to understand what they're trying to accomplish. And what does the statute try to accomplish? And what does that impose upon the people who are required to follow the statute? Uh, and can they do that? In a, is the statute clear enough? Uh, this is a really worthwhile request for us to deal with 
how do we learn of and then what do we do with potential uh, insecure and vulnerable abilities that arise in the election system. Uh, I think that that you know, in my lifetime here in Georgia, we've had all sorts of voting systems. I think at one point I, I took a little thing and punched a computer cart. Uh, in Florida, that resulted in hanging chads. Uh, and then we moved to a paper ballot, and then we moved to another electronic process, and then we moved to yet another electronic process. All of that, I think, is worthwhile that we look at changes in technology and whether or not there are systems that are safer, uh, better understood, especially by a younger population than filling out paper uh, ballots, which I don't know if they fill out anything in paper anymore. But that's just a change in culture, and I think that we always ought to see whether or not changes in cultures ought to be addressed in the systems that government presents to citizens. So the idea that we take seriously uh, vulnerabilities uh, and security incidents, while I don't agree with these definitions, uh, I do think that we ought to consider that. And, and I agree with, I think, what everybody has said on the panel, which is it's, it's time to do that so long as we can do that within the authorities granted to us. Some of these, I would agree with my colleagues, are matters for the General Assembly. And in my little taste of interacting with the General Assembly, I've reached this conclusion, that if you go to the General Assembly with a thoughtful presentation of what you would like for them to do, with adequate reasoning why that should be done, with something that is, that it is in writing that they can look at to decide whether or not it it can inform people who are, re are required to follow that law, that they are a lot more receptive than somebody going down to the General Assembly and talking to somebody in the corridor, which they do a lot of, and say, you know, we would like this, and then turn it over to somebody else to find the solution. My experience is that there's not enough of the pre-work that's required for the legislatures while they're here for their three months to be really deliberate and really understand, including the economic imposition that would, that, would be, that would be imposed upon county election officials and the counties themselves, that that all needs to be addressed. And if you do that thoughtfully in something that they can study and do that other than on the first day of the General Assembly, I think that there is a strong possibility that it would at least be favorably received might not be enacted, might be changed some, but I think that it would be given more serious consideration. And I see that is what Mr. Lindsay is proposing, is that we do this the way that it ought to be done, which is to have a group of knowledgeable people review this, these questions that are presented uh, and these remedies that are suggested in the petitions and that we try to do something that we believe we have the authority to do and which would work. And if we can't do it, to propose to the General Assembly the specific, specific legislation where they could act where we can't. To me, that's a really reasoned approach uh, to the way that we, as a board, want to do our business. There, there are security issues. You know, I, in the short time that I've been on the board, we've had a number of instances where we, where it has to be known, we, because we know that it happens that people are storing equipment in unsecured locations. Uh, and they have lots of reasons why they do that. And they have lots of reasons why they might give a key to somebody else because they're really using the facility because it's been given to them by somebody and they don't have enough space themselves. But to give, access, to give a key to somebody who is not an election official to be able to enter into that space where, where machines are being stored, even if they're not, they don't ever intend and they're fully trusted not to do any mischief, is just wrong. It's the responsibility of the election officials to secure the equipment and to make sure that only authorized people have access. 
And if it means that we have to have security people, then you have to hire security people to make sure that nobody gets access, unless they're authorized. That imposes a financial burden on the counties, and, and we ought to, in, including looking at the physical security, in addition to uh, whatever electronic vulnerabilities there might be, then we need to address those things because we know, the, the five of us know that that happens. And we've heard complaints and have had to respond to complaints of people that don't secure their facilities. So security is a vital issue. Uh, the one thing that has always disturbed me is that uh, as much burden as we put on county officials, we impose a greater responsibility on them. And to have looked at all of those videos where somebody who was an elected official holds a door open to allow people that they know are not entitled to see, to touch, to download information from machines is terribly, terribly wrong. And that's why I'm frustrated that it's taking a terribly too long period of time to respond to that. Uh, but if you think about it hard, it's that vulnerability that, that I think has created this furor, at least the, what the Ms. DeFort and Ms. Marks claim is that look at the vulnerability. Well, the vulnerability, that person could just as easily have given somebody access to paper ballots. People that want to act the way that people acted in, in Coffee County has been acting since the beginning of man. Uh, but it's a very physical vulnerability uh, and we have to find some way of making sure that only people that can be trusted in the election process are allowed to participate in it and certainly manage it, which is why I was equally upset when I heard that, that the county whose name I have, have a hard time pronouncing, Trutland, that that person was able to have access to machines in a differing county and that there was no system by which people that are hiring election officials and election people to work on machines don't get some sort of notification that this person can't be trusted with the machines. That's a security vulnerability in and of itself. And there is no, nobody has ever developed a system that where we find somebody who's not trustworthy that we let other election, other counties know that those people should not be entrusted with responsibilities with the thing that I agree with everybody is that the right to vote is in fact the fundamental, is the fundamental way in which you and I have a right to choose who leads us. And that has to, we have to do everything in our power to make sure that that right is protected in every manner and way that we can. So unless anybody else has any comments, Dr. Johnson, do you? I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move that we um, deny the petition. Is there a second? Mr. Chairman, I move that we deny the petition. In, it's been moved and seconded that the petition be the petitions be denied. Is there any further discussion? There being no further discussion, all those in favor of the motion to deny the petition say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The votes unanimous and the petitions are denied. Mr. Chairman, I don't know. of a committee at this time or wish to do so underneath your inherent power but I'd be happy to to give a motion propose a that a uh, committee of five uh, consisting of two members of the uh, election board one Republican and one Democrat guess who's going to be the Democrat uh, and three uh, folks from uh, various counties one from a larger county one from a mid-sized county one from a smaller county be uh, assembled uh, to first propose rules regarding reporting breaches and then also make proposals to the to the board by December uh, 
Well, the first one would be by the next, in terms of the rule part, be by, before the next um, uh, committee meeting or board meeting. And then regarding the legislation, be a proposal to the board by December uh, to make a, so that we can make a proposal to the General Assembly on any type of legislative changes. And that same group be, be done for both. So the motion would be to appoint uh, a committee composed of two members of the board, one Republican and one Democrat, uh, and a representative from a large county, a medium-sized county, and a small county, to, as determined by, by, the, the, by the chair. By you. Me? Yeah. Uh, by the chair. Uh, and that they promptly convene and meet and by, I, w I would say rather than the next meeting, uh, that, because we could have a special meeting to do that if we wanted to, uh, in a meeting uh, within the next 70 days, uh, that they report on how, how did you put proposed the, rules regarding uh, reporting of, okay. of, of instances of breaches of uh, the state election system? Okay. So proposed rules to report suspected breaches, and then by December first, uh, that that same group uh, report and make recommendations regarding legislation that we would request the General Assembly to consider enacting during the next legislative session. Is that accurate? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Does everybody understand the motion? Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded uh, that we move to convene the described group with the deadlines that have been stated. Is there any discussion on the motion? There being none, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. The motion passes unanimously. Well, I want to thank Ms. Marks, um, Mr. Fort, and the Attorney General's Office, and Ms. McGowan, for the information that you provided to us. It was very helpful. Um, and we have acted upon it, but appreciate your input. It's, it's valuable to us, as all input from citizens is valuable to us. So with that, we will move on to our next order of business. I announced yesterday um, at the meeting That sounds like an alarm telling me that my time was up. And so <laughs> I take it that that wasn't the case. Uh, uh, that one of the things that I did not understand, and one of the things I think a lot of the public does not understand, and it's been alluded to in the presentations made this morning, especially by the Attorney General's office, as to the update uh, that the Secretary of State has announced uh, and the update would apply to the current Dominion Suite voting system, would, would, would be beta tested now, uh, but would not be implemented until 2025. I'm not here to discuss that policy decision, but what I found is I don't know what the update is. I don't know what it does. I don't know what it seeks to address or fix, or how does it seek to expand the functionality of the system. Um, and I think not only should I know that and everybody else on the board know that, I think everybody needs to know that because I get lots of emails about the update and I'm not sure anybody really knows what the update does. Uh, it's been characterized, but I, but I think if we are going to evaluate public arguments uh, and arguments here about the update, we need to know what the update does. So I've asked the Attorney General's office, uh, and specifically Blake Evans and whoever else he wants to help explain this. To, I'm sorry, Secretary of State's office. The, the, I assume that the Attorney General's office would not like to do that. <laughs> um, correct, okay. 
Um, so if, may I turn the floor over to you to explain to us what the update is and what it does. And it's, I don't wanna, I see you're bringing up your rules book. Yeah, this is a fact presentation about what the update does and not a legal analysis of what, how it fits into the statutory scheme, you know, unless it's not necessary to explain. I agree, don't worry. You've heard enough from me. I'm not gonna talk. I'm gonna turn over to our elections director, but I just wanted to give my uh, little lawyer disclaimer first that there are, that Georgia law prohibits us from disclosing information that would jeopardize the security of our election system, including software. So there's just certain information, technical information that um, our staff cannot get into. And I, I want the board to understand that to the extent they can't answer a question, it's not because they're being evasive, but just we have to protect what information we can disclose. No, we fully understand that. Welcome, Mr. Evans. Thank you <coughs> and uh, good morning board um, you know one of the things that we often have to tell counties sometimes is when we get questions is you need to you know this is what the code says consult with your county attorney so I often remind them that I practice what I preach and keep my attorney very close by but what I want to do today really in this presentation you're gonna have hear a little bit of me and then you're going to hear a little bit of, of Michael Barnes, um, who is our Deputy Director of Voting Systems uh, here in Georgia. And um, I'll say that I am very fortunate to work beside somebody like Michael. Uh, Michael has been a servant to the voters of Georgia for um, over 25 years. And not many states, in fact, I don't know of another state that has uh, somebody in the voting systems realm uh, like what we have in Michael and so he's, he's very uh, very knowledgeable and so I'm excited to have him beside me for this um, but what I want to do in this presentation is first I want to kind of start high level and then we'll get a little bit more granular but I want to start with just kind of an overview uh, and defining what the Secretary of State's role is whenever we get a new software installation like what we have with Dominion 517 and then second I'll provide some specific context as far as where we're at in the process of assessing 517 and then third I'll hand it over to Michael um, since he is on the team that is actually reviewing 517 for uh, potential state certification and so first focusing on uh, the Secretary of State's um, role. So by the time that we get a new software installation in our office, it has gone through already review uh, and certification by the United States Election Assistance Commission. And what generally happens is that a vendor, in this case Dominion, will submit for review software. And then the United States Election Assistance Commission will get one of the voting system test laboratories, which there are two of in the country. Those are commonly referred to as VISTLs. So they'll get one of the VISTLs to review the software. And what the VISTL will do is they'll take the software and they'll run it against what is also called as voluntary voting system guidelines. You might see the acronym VVSG for those. Uh, as of now, the highest VVSG virgin, version that has had equipment certified against, so all the way through the process to certification, is 1.0. So after the software version is tested uh, against the VVSG standards by the VISTL, uh, the VISTL will submit a report to the EAC. The EAC reviews the report, and then assuming that uh, the equipment has met the standards, the EAC can issue their certification. Uh, at that point, the software version can be submitted to our office where we are required to review it or where we can review it uh, for state certification uh, pursuant to OCGA 21-2-300 and OCGA 21-2-379.24.
Uh, so once we receive the software installation, we begin reviewing it because obviously with, with voting, vendor, voting system vendors like Dominion, they have customers all over the country. And the EAC is looking at it from a federal perspective. We have to look at it and make sure that the software works within the context of Georgia. And so now I'll pivot to the second item, and that's where Dominion 517 fits kind of within that timeline and that framework that I just laid out. So Dominion uh, ver Software Suite uh, 517 was certified by the EAC in mid-March, and then we got a copy of the new installation and began reviewing it. Uh, we began testing it to determine among other things, the functionality of it, also the time and effort that it takes to update the equipment. In addition to these efforts, part of what we do or what we can do uh, when we have a new software installation is obviously reach out to other jurisdictions around the country, our connections, our network, to figure out what their experience is with the software. And so we've been doing that as well. Um, we also communicate, we're in frequent communication with the vendors to see what their experiences are as they communicate with customers and perform installations in other parts of the country. Um, so since we're still working through this process, what we have right now is an incomplete picture of 517 because we're still reviewing it. Uh, so some of the information that we have so far before I hand it over to Michael. Uh, we do know currently that the software installation um, does not currently work with the other components of the system that we have in Georgia. And when I say that, uh, there were two counties in Ohio that upgraded to Dominion 517. Um, one of them rolled back from 517 to their, their other version because they have an election upcoming in August. Um, and what they found was that cards encoded by their electronic poll books when put into the ballot marking devices could not bring up a ballot. And so the ballot, can, the ballot marking device could not read the voter access card. Um, so we also know, and we're keeping track of this, uh, the update has not been used in an election. The first election where it will be used uh, in a jurisdiction is in Ohio uh, in August. And so we're keeping close tracks of that. At this point, um, you know, I want to state unequivocally we're committed to continuing the process of learning more about 517. Michael and his team are, are testing it. They're learning more about it. As uh, Ms. McGowan mentioned earlier, we are planning pilots in several jurisdictions in November of this year where we want to see how the, the software update um, functions from the beginning of the elections process to the end of the elections process. Obviously, with that, what we'll, we need to make sure that the poll book is compatible by that point, which we're working with our poll book vendor to, to uh, make sure that we stay up to date uh, with the progress on that. Uh, but we're hoping that that's at a point where it is compatible for us to be able to run pilots. Um, so for that, what I'm going to do at this point is hand it over to Michael Barnes. Welcome, Mr. Barnes. Uh, good morning. Uh, again, my name is Michael Barnes. I serve under Blake in the Secretary of State's office as his Deputy Director of Elections, and, and I work mainly with the voting systems that we use in the state of Georgia. Um, we have begun the process of interacting with the Dominion Suite 517 to get a true understanding of what changes um, we may see between 5, 5A, five which is what we are currently using in Georgia, as we transition potentially to 517. Um, the one good news, I think, um, from a voter experience, which what a Georgia voter will see when they interact with a touchscreen if we transition to 517, it, it's not a big change for what the voter experience will be. However, the majority of the changes are really in the back end of the system. Um, primarily within the election management system, and that is the system that builds the ballots. That's the system that counts the ballots. 
That's also the system that transfers the information from the election management system to the devices that are used, the BMDs, the scanners themselves. Um, because un unfortunately what we've been, what we've called this process is potentially, we call it an upgrade. It's really not an upgrade. Um, this, even though it, sa it starts five, it says 517 and we may use 55, this really will require us to fully rebuild the system. And that means the election management systems have to be completely rebuilt. The operating systems on those devices have to be renewed, updated to a different version. Uh, the back end applications in which these applications sit have to be updated and replaced. Um, so uh, an additional amount of hardware has got to be procured for county use. And I'm not talking about touch screens and ballot scanners. I'm talking about the CPUs that are placed within the county offices uh, that that run the elections process, where the election project sits, where the ballots become tabulated. Um, and we were not anticipating that initially when um, we began having discussions with Dominion about potential changes in the voting system. Um, but that now is what we are seeing, is that we are gonna have to look into um, going back to the legislature and asking for potential funds to um, upgrade some of the CPUs that are at the county level. There may be an opportunity us for to, to reuse some equipment that is already at the place, but I, I'm afraid we're probably not gonna be able to do that. Um, in regards to your BMDs, to your scanners, um, those are still available to be used with the new democracy suite, but that will require not just a simple install and update and hit update, we're gonna actually have to break them all the way back down to the BIOS level. Um, we've got to change a BIOS setting. We've got to adjust operating systems and then install applications. All of this process takes a significant amount of time per individual device. Um, in the testing that we have done um, in our office, it takes with our staff about 15 to 18 minutes to go through a full installation process on a single BMD. For the installation on an optical scan unit, we're looking at about approximately 20 minutes, but there is some scalability in the optical scan units. We can have multiple optical scans going through an update process at a simultaneous period. The other, the other issue we will have as we take on the process of potentially updating is the equipment is not all in one central location. Um, it is spread out amongst 159 counties. So it will be an effort to figure out the logistics of whether the update process, it will require us to go to each individual county and do the work locally, or will we have to work with the counties to potentially bring equipment back to some sort of um, locational hub and do the work in a hubbed environment. Um, and all those decisions are yet to be made. Um, but as Blake alluded to, we are still in the process of learning more about 517. Um, learning also what we will need to undertake to train our local officials on the use of 517. Is there any additional information that we need to make sure voters are aware of in regards to 517? Um, there is some additional um, hardware that's available in 517 that we have not previously used. There is a, an, an upgrade to the ballot scanner that is available under 517 that does not currently work with the 5.5 the 5 .5 option that we have. And there are some larger counties in the state that may be interested in potentially procuring this additional hardware um, because of its scalability, its ability to hold more information. Um, so there's a lot of information that we're yet to really fully understand and, and get the full grasp of. So we want to move in a very meticulous fashion where we learn about this process, where we learn about 517, and we can then instruct county election officials to the best of our ability on what things they will have to be, do in order to execute elections successfully moving forward. So we are in the process of learning. Um, I wish we were at a state where we knew everything about it at this point, but unfortunately we do not. Um, the biggest surprise that we've encountered so far is the fact that the poll pads are not yet compatible 
with 517. Um, the vendors are working together to resolve that, but we don't yet have a timetable on how long that may take. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of thankful that we had not gotten too far out ahead of ourselves um, because we could have really been in a situation where we could have been inadvertently impacted in an upcoming election. So I'm thankful that we have, are taking this meticulous approach at this point in time to learn as much as we can about 517. From the board members? Questions? Um, for you, one for that um, <clears throat> let's sort of take a timeline here. Um, and I'm, I want to make sure I understand because I've heard lots of different things here. What is the drop, for want of a better term, drop dead point in which whatever system we have, we have to have it for the 2024 elections? Because I realize, you know, we're not talking about November. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have, we have a general election in November. We have uh, primaries and runoffs in May and June, May, 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 May and June and July. We have special elections. We have a presidential primary in March. So in order to have this, whatever system we have ready for you, and then for you guys to do whatever you need to do to prepare for the election, what is the drop dead date? It's getting very close, um, but I will try my best to give you a, a timeline yeah. answer. Um, the, the scheduled presidential preference primary is early March. Yeah. We have to have ballots ready in the county's hands for mail out distribution no later than 49 days prior to the election for UACAVA voting purposes. That means that the election project that has to exist in order for ballots to be generated and ballots printed has to be completed. We always aim to have all election projects for an election completed, especially when there's a 49-day um, ballot, ballot window at 60 days prior to that scheduled election. So we're going to have to have all of the election projects for the state of Georgia finished by middle of January. In order to build those databases, we, uh, election project files, we start receiving information from the counties in November of the preceding year. Um, I believe that we will be obtaining from the, um, the Democratic and Republican parties somewhere around November um, who will be the candidates uh, for their parties on the presidential preference ballot. Once that information is received, we're also receiving information from counties if they plan to have any special elections tied to the presidential preference primary. And we're trying to ob obtain that information at 90 days or sooner prior to an election so that we have adequate time to put that information to organize the ballot uh, to provide counties ample time to proof the ballot to confirm that what is laid out is properly correct. And then once they sign off, we have to finalize it, we have to get the ballots to print, we have to get the election project packaged so it can be delivered to the county so that it can then be installed locally on their election management system so that counties can then begin the process of their logic and accuracy um, steps prior to the election. So, the voting system needs to be in place for a uniform system of voting in the state of Georgia. We've got to be ready to go in December. Okay. Mr. Chairman, could I ask another one? Uh, so along the same lines. Of yes. I'm, I'm curious, uh, I'm not sure which one of you sort of commented about Ohio, but Ohio is also dealing with the same software updates. Uh, and apparently there was a problem with compatibility between the hardware and the software that Ohio uh, was equally concerned about. But, but they seem to have, maybe, maybe I have it a little bit wrong here. What did they do in order to fix that compatibility problem so that they could have 517 in place or at least by a pilot program by August? So what, what did they do in order to fix that? What, um what, Ohio, what the various counties in Ohio are doing, and Ohio is a different system than, of course, what we do in Georgia. Georgia is a uniform system where every county is using the same type of equipment. In Ohio, it's, it's jurisdictional. Each county decides what they use to service their, their um, voters. 
Um, in those Ohio counties that have been transitioning to 517, there are multiple poll book vendors um, in play, but there are two poll book vendors that are unable to currently work with the 517 model. Um, that's uh, No Inks Poll Pad and 10X is the other vendor who is currently unable to work. Um, the jurisdictions in Ohio, what they have opted to do, one county, because they wanted to still maintain the use of their poll pads, or actually their 10X devices, have decided to downgrade from 517 and actually go back to their 5.5 level on their voting machines so that they will be able to still use their poll pads to manage the voters as they come in and participate during the election. The, another county that has that same dilemma of we have a set of poll books that are not working currently with our 517 environment what that county has opted to do is to not use their poll pads or their poll books for this election. That they are gonna go through another mechanism of preparing the voter access cards that will be then given to the voter that will allow them to interact with the machine. So they, they are using a different tool to create the voter access card that'll be presented to the voter and they are not using their normal poll pad procedure. How many counties in Ohio are using the Dominion system? Um, the last count I got from um, the vendor yesterday, I believe that there are seven counties in Ohio that have now upgraded to 517. And of those, how many counties are there totally? Um, I'm not aware of the total number of counties in Ohio. Do you have a, a good estimation? <laughs> it would be nothing but an estimation, and I, I would hate to be inaccurate on that. Uh, they don't have 159 counties, I know that. <laughs> 88 counties, thank you, 88 counties. <laughs> you're off by one, but you're forgiven. Um, in how many updates has Dominion offered to Dominion users since we first bought the system for use in our elections? Um, in checking what is currently federally certified under the Dominion, uh, and the, under the Dominion brand with EAC, I was checking yesterday. Um, there are, I believe there are four different versions of the 5.5 series. There's A, B, C, and D. Um, the newest version is 5.17. And does 5.17 incorporate everything that was in the prior updates? Um, it incorporates um, a lot of various things um, from when the last time Dominion had put a suite together for EAC certification. There have been hardware enhancements. Uh, there have been statutory changes in elections um, in our state, but also in other states that they serve. So vendors tend to put those type of items into their, into their suites so that they can expand their customer base potentially. And of these EAC certified updates, how many of those did we, Georgia, incorporate onto our machines? Um, we have only stayed with the 5.5A series. Um, there has been, we, we went through a, an update, which was a true um, update of one of the applications within the election suite in 2020, and that was on the BMD touchscreen that we had to go through an application update in order to facilitate um, a, a two column screen when we had 21 candidates for a single contest. Um, and so we had to actually up, um, upgrade or update our version number from 5.5.10.30 to 5.5.10.32. Yeah, I'll try to remember. Yeah, if you do, congratulations. That's in, in these updates, ones that weren't implemented in Georgia and in 5.7, if you can answer this, do any of those address security and making the, the system more secure? The, 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 five, the 517 application, uh, Democracy Suite, 
was developed in response to those concerns that have been raised over the last two to three years. And do you know with more specificity what the concerns are that are addressed in 5.17? I'm afraid if I start getting into some of those answers that I'm, I'm, I'm opening ourselves up to talking about things that we would be unsafe to disclose. Well, can you do it in a more general way? Um, there are the, basically the applicational backgrounds, the backbones of the, on which the applications are being reinforced and enhanced. And that's, I think that's about as far as I can get. What does reinforced and advanced mean? This gets into the, the coding that you put in place within applications to um, make applications more secure. And is that more secure with respect to internal or external threats? It's a combination of both. And is that being implemented in 5.17 throughout the system for everybody who uses it that's being offered? Yes. Okay. Is it, is it your sense that this will be a good update that will be good for the machines that we use in Georgia? Um, the process of learning about it is absolutely a, a good step to learn more about. Um, I, I have been around a lot of voting systems um, in my time, and sometimes when a new version comes out, it's best to be cautious because there might be another new version coming right behind it. Because sometimes that, that, that thing that we thought was, that fixed everything turns out, eh, it got close, but not quite. Um, so I can't say with absolute that yes, this will be great because it is an element that we need to learn more about it before we move too quickly. Just one more question on timing. If, if, if for the presidential preference, you have to be able to build ballots and the system be available for voters. That, you, that has to occur by December, did you say? Yes, sir. Okay. Is it possible to do all the things that you described were necessary to do the investigation and state certification and be comfortable with the system? Is it possible that that could be done by December? It, it's really important for us to see the use of any update to the system, any upgrade, any, any change to the system in a real election environment. Um, before we transition to our current system, we actually put the system through a piloting effort in 2019. And we did that in an effort to learn not only how to use it, but also how to train officials and train voters on how to use it. And it's very important to have those real election circumstances because things happen in elections that sometimes we don't anticipate. And it's not when the election goes perfectly, how does it react? It's how does it react when something happens that we weren't expecting? And that's, that's the real life experience we gained through a pilot. And with the pilot scheduled for November, of course, as long as the poll pad application gets in line and we are able to use it, um, if we're not done with a piloting op operation until November, I don't know how we could then transition to a statewide implementation in 30 days. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, going back to me, Mr. Chairman. Going back. Oh. Why can we not use Ohio as the piloting uh, aspects? Um, well, we definitely use other jurisdictions and learn from their experiences. The one thing with the, the Ohio experience, Ohio and the counties that are updating to 517, they actually don't use it as a BMD client. They use it as a DRE, um, a direct record electronic system. So it's the same touch screen, but what the voter does in Ohio is they interact with the touch screen and then the ballot is printed out onto a little tape that's attached to the touchscreen device. The voter looks at the tape, looks at the selections on the tape, and then if they accept it, 
um, the tape rolls up and that becomes the, the vote of record. So they're using a compartment of 517, but it is not the same thing that we would be using in the state of Georgia. So we can learn a lot, but it's still not in the same environment that we would be using it. Okay. Just a one question. Have, do you have an accurate estimate of how many person hours it would take to do the full upgrade? Um, I don't have an, an accurate estimate as of yet um, because, again, not understanding yet how we would, how we would handle the logistics. Um, it will take a tremendous, I started doing some calculations on man hours, but unless I know if I've got to travel to the county or if they're coming to me, it's hard to come up with a good estimate at this point. Yes, okay, worst case scenario. Worst case having, scenario. Having to go out to 150. Worst case scenario. Um, I do have experience of us having to go out in the counties and do updates on the pre-existing system, but that update was a much quicker installation process. This is a much bigger rebuild. Um, in those exercises in the past, it was always a six-month operation. With this process, I honestly am thinking it's probably going to be closer to a nine to ten-month operation. So that's based on um, personnel available? It's based on personnel available, yes. And when, when you do this, do you hire supplemental personnel for the rollout and then on a part-time or a temporary basis? Um, um, each, um, the leadership in each agency determines what they think is the best course. Um, in previous installations under different administrations, um, we used, um, uh, we used a, actually a contracted source. Uh, that had a relationship with the Secretary of State's office for installation purposes. I don't know of yet how the Secretary of State's office might want to facilitate this installation process because of what will be involved. Um, my division, of course, would be involved heavily. Uh, I have seven to ten people that report to me, um, but we're going to need a lot more than that. I know that we have made some, um, some inroads into working with the Technical Colleges of Georgia to maybe um, use some personnel from the Technical College of Georgia to help us with this process. But those discussions are very in, in the very preliminary state. And I think you said that the system requires new CPUs to be used in each of the counties. And it doesn't work without the new CPUs. I mean, you need new CPUs for it to work. You're going to need the CPUs because one of the elements of federal certification is that it actually gets down to the hard le hardware level where it says this type of device is, you know, this server, this what was classified as like an express server, is on a particular type of Dell machine uh, that has certain workings there within. So, yes, we're going to have to make some adjustments at the CPU level. And ultimately, would the counties have to pay for the new CPUs? That is, um, that is an element of the Secretary of State's office having to determine what that is going to be. Um, I can't speak to that at this point in time. Do the counties have at least an order of magnitude of maybe what that equipment costs so that they can go? Not at this point. Do you have a thought? Um, I don't have an order of magnitude of what the cost would be at this point, um, but it would, it, it would not be insignificant. Well, that's pretty ambiguous, but I understand. <laughs> <laughs> you know, insignificant might be different things to different people, but for counties, I think that in significance is a pretty low level. Um, okay, thank you. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. One, one last question. about worst case scenario in terms of time. Let's just take the best case scenario. Let me ask you this practical. Everyone brings all the equipment to the World Congress Center and you're able to do all of the uh, necessary upgrades to the equipment at one location. Does that shorten the time period you need? It, um, in a centralized location with all the people that you could possibly need, it's going to shorten the time. Um, but, you know, possibly one way to, we've sort of done this before, 
We did this in 2020 with the initial rollout, um, and we went through in a central warehouse 30,000 devices that were installed and then acceptance tested by the state and then packaged and distributed out to the counties. And in that central warehouse environment, it was still six to seven months. Okay. And I assume in order to get the machines to a central environment, that would be a cost that would have to be incurred by the county? Um, I suspect there would be some county costs. What those county costs would be, how much they would be, I do not know. I'm just, no, I understand that. Dr. Johnson. <clears throat> Michael, does, does this um, upgrade elevate the certification to BBSG2? Um, no, ma'am, it does not. 517 was certified, 517 was, un, was certified under the VVSG 1.0. At this point in time, I believe there's only one voting system that's currently in review by the VISTALs at the 2.0 state. Um, and could we use, utilize the upgrade without using pole pads? That would be a decision that would be made by um, people above my pay level. Um, but it, could it be possible to do that? It could be if you chose not to use pole pad for, for voter access card activation. Okay. And does, does this satisfy the, the CISA mitigation recommendations the 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 software package was worked in response to those i will just say that that's what it was brought brought forward based upon okay and this um is this part of what will be presented as far as health check of the computer of the voting system don't ask me. Uh, well, you, I, I thought, uh, Blake, were you going to speak to the health check? Okay. Um, I, I, can, I can answer some of your questions on the health check. Um, we are currently in the process of visiting all 159 counties in the state um, to sit down with their election management systems that are currently in place. Um, and to do an assessment on those CPUs to determine if they are ready um, and basically in a, in a health way for the upcoming elections. Do they have the applications that they are supposed to have? Not only do they have the applications, do they have the right installation of those applications present? Um, is, the, is the system connected as it should be? Is it working? Is it working in the sense of where it's sharing information across all of the CPUs that may be connected to that system within the county? We are also inspecting their voting equipment um, and assessing whether on what has been installed on the equipment is what's supposed to be there. And not only is it um, installed properly, but also is it functioning properly? Is it acting as it should? Is it taking the acceptance of an elections project file? Is the interaction of the voter as expected as should be when you put a test scenario in? Are ballots being produced as they should? Are those ballots then being scanned and tabulated properly? So we are in the process of visiting all 159 counties. I think as of yesterday, we've completed visiting eight counties. So we've still got a, a lot of work in front of us and this will be ongoing through the rest of the calendar year. Um, we, we are gonna try to get as much done before the end of August as we can. Uh, because we know we have a lot of jurisdictions that will have ongoing elections um, that they must be preparing for in September, October, November. But those jurisdictions that don't have an elections will continue in, um, visiting those counties. And it's our objective to complete all 159 counties by the end of the calendar year. Just one final thing on just on that answer. And I don't know if it was Mr. Evans or you, but I think there was a statement saying that the machines had nothing added to them. What do you, I don't know if I heard that correctly, but. Well, what we are, what we are looking at is the status of their equipment. And we have the ability to know what's supposed to be there. Uh -huh. And we are making sure that what is there is what's supposed to be there. Meaning that if something is not supposed to be there, you would address it. Yes. Okay. So, so you'll do a virus check? Um, we are check. We are checking uh, the system to validate that what's in the system is what's supposed to be there. Yes, ma'am. Okay. 
and review of like intruder log or something? Yes, ma'am. Questions lead to more questions. Uh, these these health checks or whatever you want to call them, up uh, in terms of our system. Given the fact, you know, assuming for a minute we do not do the upgrade to 517, uh, has CISA weighed in on on whether or not the remedial efforts that we are taking to attempt to ensure our system is sufficient? Has CISA weighed in on that? Anything about CISA. To our knowledge, CISA has not made any statement on it. Is, uh, is it appropriate for us to make that request to CISA to see if it's, if, if it's adequate in their opinion? Is that an appropriate inquiry to CISA? So we, we, um, CISA, so we, we were reached out to, I believe, the EAC field team and, and had an initial meeting with them um, and there's a chance they might come to kind of observe. Um, Michael, do you have any more details on that? We're, I know it's kind of early. Yeah. Um, thank you, Blake, for reminding me. We have had a discussion with um, the EAC Field Services Office um, and I have invited them actually to come uh, down to Georgia to go with us out as we're doing some of these health checks so they can see what we are doing in, a, in an effort to make sure that the system in Georgia is ready for the elections that are on coming. So we feel like that is an opportunity for EAC to be involved to see what steps we are taking to make sure that Georgia elections are ready. Yeah, I guess my, my point is that I think it would reassure a lot of folks if either EAC or CISA or some other agency other than the Secretary of State's office, somebody could validate what you are proposing okay. independently. Uh, I'll leave it up to you guys to figure out who. Mr. I have a question. Um, in response to Mr. Lindsay's question, I think you were answering what what can I build, and you backed out of an elect you back an election. You ended up with a 30-day period between November and December. I think you were answering the question, what can I build, what can we build, but as I also here, this is actually not going to be ready to be put in place until the Secretary of State and the General Assembly figure out how we're going to pay for new CPUs, which you said is not an insignificant number. So, the, so there is no way to do it November to December. There's no way to do it in December of this year. I guess that's my advantage. Is I, I, don't, I don't have to figure out the money. <laughs> Um, and there is a money compartment to this, um, and that's again for people above my pay grade to be figuring out what we can or cannot do yet. Thank you. I wanted to go back to um, your description of some of the, the upgrades and to talk about specifically some of the scanners and how that might impact some of the larger counties. Now, my my assumption, which please correct me if it's wrong, is that some of these upgrades would allow the larger counties to use a single scanner for early voting because it will accept more ballot styles. Um, potentially. What potentially. We will, potentially. What the, they have increased the ability to hold more information. Um, however, we want to be able to see is it still enough to hold what we would have to do in Fulton County, for example. Um, we feel like it is, but when you start getting into a general primary ballot that's 18 inches long, in some cases it's two pieces of paper that are 18 inches long, and all the information that goes into that, um, when you create the digital image that we have to collect along with it, um, they say that it can hold it. I I'd like to see it um, and test it out. And now, is this a hardware upgrade in addition to a software upgrade for this? Functionality. That would be a whole new piece of hardware. Right. Um, right. There are what we use in the state of Georgia is classified as an ICP, Image Cast Precinct. The new piece of hardware that's available in the Democracy 17 suite is an ICP2, um, Image Cast Precinct 2. It's just a different model. Uh, it maintains information in a different type of storage media. And can I? 
Is it an accurate guess that it would not be, could not be retrofitted to be compatible with? It, yeah, it, unfortunately it is, not, it is not compatible with our version. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any further questions? To both of you, this has been really, really helpful. Uh, and I think it's probably been helpful to everybody who's listened to it is to understand what it is rather than just referring it to the update to have context and facts to evaluate what the update is, uh, is, is I, I found personally enlightening. Probably some of the things that we ought to do maybe more often, uh, but, but thank you for coming. Thank you for agreeing to do this. And you know, I think it tells me that maybe we ought to be doing more of these educational sessions, but thank you. All right, now we will move on to item three, where we are going to consider violation cases recommended for letters of instruction or referral to the Attorney General's office, which is a continuation of what we were doing at the end of the meeting yesterday. And we'll begin with case number That was not for you. That was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, case number 2019-43, Paulding County, includes space violation. And we have a re you all get settled. If we would like to have a report on that, please. Morning. Board and Chair. Good morning. All right. So we'll start off with case number SEB 2019-043, Paulding County enclosed space violation. On November 5th, 2019, an SOS employee was observing the pilot use of the ballot marking devices at the Paulding County Watson government complex. She observed three citizens in the enclosed space looking at the BMDs. She took a few photos of the individuals. Once the investigator viewed the photos, he identified those citizens that were in the enclosed space as Richard DeMillo, Marilyn Marks, and Rhonda Martin. Deidre Holden, the Paulding County Election Supervisor advised that the three entered the enclosed space without permission and they never identified themselves to the poll manager. Gail Combs, the poll manager at the location, stated that the three individuals went into the voting area and the male, Mr. DeMillo, took photos of the equipment. She said that the three did not ask for permission to enter the voting area and she did not know that they could not be in the space. She later identified the three via photos as the subject inside the voting space. The investigator interviewed all the poll workers and all stated that they did not give the citizens permission to enter the enclosed space. 
The investigator reached out to other election precincts in the surrounding counties for Lindia Kennerly, the poll manager at the Smyrna 1A precinct at Argyle Elementary School indicated that she had issues with two females. She described them as a blonde haired woman and a dark haired woman. According to her, the dark haired woman identified herself as a poll worker. So Mrs. Kennerly allowed her inside the enclosed space. She asked for, she asked her for her credentials and the dark haired woman did not have any. She told her that she should have documents and identification if she was a poll worker and that she instructed her to sit in a different area. The investigator sent Kennerly a photo and she identified Marilyn Marks and Rhonda Martin as the females who came into the polling location. She stated that Mr. DeMillo never came into the enclosed area. All three citizens denied going to the Argyle Elementary voting location. So based on this, we determined evidence suggests that Gail Combs, Deidre Holden, and the Paulding County Board of Elections and Registration violated Georgia Code 212413H when they allowed the citizens to enter and remain inside the enclosed space at the Watson government complex when they were not voting or acting in the capacity of a poll watcher or poll officer. It indicates that it shall be the duty of the chief manager to secure the observances of this code section to keep order in the polling place and to see that no more persons are admitted within the enclosed space Also, poll manager Gail Combs allowed Marilyn Marks, Rhonda Martin, Richard DeMillo to enter and remain inside the enclosed space at the location when they were not voting or acting in the capacity of designated poll watchers. Also, there's evidence to suggest that Marilyn Marks, Richard DeMillo violated Georgia election code 212413, when they entered and remained inside the enclosed space when they were not voting or acting in the capacity as poll watchers or poll officers at the Watson government complex. And then there's also evidence to indicate that Rhonda Martin violated two counts with the violation at the Watson government complex and at Argyle Elementary, based on the statements of Ms. Connerly. All right, is there, is responded Paulding County Board of Elections and Voter Registrations present? Would they like to be heard? <clears throat> yes, please. Well, I tell you what, it might be, since he's all set up there, um, this microphone should work if once I turn it on, which is try that. Okay, thank you. Thank you for having us here. Thank you for your, your presentation. I'm Deidre Holden. I'm the elections director for Paulding County. Um, I do want to say something before I go into what we're here about. I want to commend this um, board for reaching out to counties and getting our input because I've been doing this since 2004 and I've never seen this happen. It is important to us as election directors and officials to know that you wanna know what we do. So thank you. On to this case, um, I wanna say this. Um, in 2019, Paulding County was the largest county to be a part of the pilot using the new voting system. We were excited to do that. On that day, we had the Secretary of State and a lot of his staff there and media from all over the United States. This was a big deal. Um, I was not in the area when Ms. Marks um, came in. Uh, I was notified by a member of the Secretary of State staff because she was standing there at the entrance of the enclosed space. 
I think one of the arguments you're going to hear is there's no such thing as an enclosed space. And I disagree with that. You may have photos that have been submitted to you. Uh, the Watson Government Complex is where our office is located. And we use a very large area to vote the masses of voters that we see. Our area is petitioned off. It's very clear that there are voting machines in there. We also employ what we call a um, machine host that stays in that area for the entire duration of the election. So those machines are being constantly watched. If a voter has a question, they raise their hand and that machine host goes and assists them. Um, you know, I've always been one that believes that we should learn something new every day and when we start, when we stop learning is when we fail. Um, thankfully, I've never had to identify uh, an enclosed space, but when this happened, you better believe I, I identify enclosed spaces now. Um, once that happened, we post um, signs at all of our polling locations identifying what the enclosed space is. So that was a lesson learned. Um, I believe that in 2020, when we went through the pandemic and we finally got to have an election in June, at this point, the Secretary of State was making enclosed space signs and issuing them to every county in the state. Uh, we haven't had this issue since 2019. I understand um, the excitement about this system. I understand people wanting to see it, but there are boundaries. There are lines that you don't cross. Um, had I been out there, I would have been able to assist Ms. Marks uh, and her um, friends that were with her. But I do want to say that we do now. We have put procedures in place where it is very <coughs> identifiable of where the enclosed space is. Do you have any questions? Would you find it more helpful to have these definitions of enclosed space um, articulated more clearly in, in the regulations? Because under the regulations right now, the, the, the <coughs> rulemaking that was done through, through this body, um, it says it shall be enclosed with a guardrail or barrier. Would it be helpful for your um, implementation and enforcement to, to adjust that? Absolutely. I think there's a lot of gray areas in the code and in the rules mm -hmm. that need to be more defined so we'll know uh, and so that the voters know. Um, that's who we work for and we want their experience to be a positive one when they come to any polling location. So I do think it needs to be better defined. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I I've been out to Paulding County, and I have toured their facilities personally, and uh, they run a first-class um, shop out there, and I was very impressed with um, their how they their diligence and their um, their their zeal for elections. So, one of the things that kind of concerns me about these cases sometimes is that the counties will report they've had this problem. And then we turn around and say, our, our answer to this problem is we're going to prosecute you. Yeah. Uh, and so I think there's a little unfairness uh, there. And so f f kind of for that reason, um, pictures, I mean, pick the defendants, the other respondents in this, in this case is all together, but we're kind of doing them one at a time. But the, the respondents in this uh, presented pictures of Watson and I looked at those pictures and that has a very well defined enclosed space with a very well defined barrier. I mean it's a tiny little passageway with blockers. Yes. I mean so and I, I was a poll watcher for many years so I'm funneling all this through my knowledge as a poll watcher. I've been in the hundreds of precincts mm -hmm. and, and just for the people out there listening my practice that I never had a problem with in 20 years, 25 years maybe, 
was I would, ident I would walk up to the poll manager with my ID, identify myself, and say, where would you like for me to stand? And if I didn't like it, the statute says, if you have a problem with the poll manager, you report it to the election superintendent. So for everybody out there, if you wanna know what an experienced poll watcher has as advice, that's the way to do it. Um, so I do, I would, I would prefer that we dismiss the charge against Paulding County, but if the board is not inclined to do that, I think a letter of instruction of saying, please be more diligent in keeping people out of the enclosed space and don't let strangers in the enclosed spaces is, is warranted, but I, I'm very sensitive that we not establish a practice where we punish people who report violations. Um, I would like to comment to what you said, Mr. Mashburn. Um, I appreciate the passion that Ms. Marks has. I, I look up to her. Um, she's, she's a wonderful person. Um, and in no way in Paulding County would we ever discourage a poll watcher or an observer in fact, we invite people to come watch the process because people don't understand the elections until they see it on the backside. So we want people to come in and watch that process. We want people to be interested. And, um, you know, I, I don't think there was any ill intent of Ms. Marks and, and the people that were with her. Um, I think she was just very interested in this new voting system. Um, but there again, I don't like to be blamed for something that really didn't happen. Um, it happened that they went in there, but to say that it's my fault or my board's fault, we've done everything we can do. We've trained people. And um, I just think that a better definition and also better training um, for people who are going to be poll watchers and who are going to be poll observers to say, look, you need to follow these protocol and there won't be any issues. So I appreciate what you said. I have a further question. You said that you've added new marking? Yes, we made signs. We immediately made signs and started posting them in all of our polling locations that identify the enclosed space. Right. It says this is the enclosed space and we cite the rule in the code. So with respect to this enclosed space at the Watson, mm -hmm. Community Center or Watson, Watson Government, Government uh, mm -hmm. Center. Did you place the signs at that entrance where people would, would enter that was, had these? At Watson, that is our largest early voting location, but right. it's also one of our largest precincts. So after this occurred uh, and we realized, look, we want people to know what the enclosed space is. Watson has two enclosed spaces. We have one that we have for our elderly and disabled, so they don't have to stand in line for a long time. And then we have the larger enclosed space for just the regular voters. So yes, yeah, signs are placed at the entrance before anybody walks in and breaches that area. It says, this is the enclosed space. So you didn't redefine the enclosed space, you just put we, signage to show Absolutely, them. yes sir. And second, did you freely let citizens that were interested in this walk in and out of the enclosed space? No, sir. Did you ever see anybody milling around to look at the operation no, and to observe it? No, sir. I was not out there when this happened. I had you know, 18 more precincts right. I had to deal with that day. But I will say, um, with the Secretary of State staff being there, um, it was just recently uh, brought to my attention. I was told that this was going to be a state case, not on a county level. But there again, I see you know where Miss Coombs had to be brought in place because she was the poll manager, and it happened while she was there. Right. But um, you know, when we have observers, they're very um, polite. They come and they tell us they're there to observe they don't interfere with the election process. If they did, I would deal with it. Um, but I think that people know their limits. Uh, poll watchers have more uh, restrictions on them than an observer, and an observer can just come in and watch everything, and we want them to, um, but I was not aware that this happened. But we've never had this happen in any of our polling locations or early voting. Would you say observer, what do you mean by that? 
anybody can come in and watch the process. From where? From, I mean, my neighbor could come in and say, hey, I want to watch what's going on, and we have to allow them. Um, and I think that's good because that shows that they're interested and they want to make sure we're doing our jobs and they're holding us accountable. Um, but a poll watcher has restrictions. A poll watcher is there to make sure the election is flowing as it should. They're there to identify any issues and bring those to our attention as well. An observer is just there to make sure, or they're not really there to make sure of anything. They're just watching. They're just observing what's going on. And can an observer walk, walk around the areas where people are voting just to see what's happening? They can walk around. Um, most of our observers just come in and sit down and they, they can sit in an area where they can see everything that's going on. They don't talk to the voters. Um, they just watch. They just watch the process. But can they watch and walk? So can, can, they walk can a watcher, can a, somebody who's an observer, let's say you have three different areas of people that are voting using the mm -hmm. uh, ballot marking devices, can they kind of walk around there to see how people are using them and what they look like? We, we don't let them go close to our voters because we don't ever want to give up that secrecy of their ballot. Right. They can watch at a distance. I think six foot is a good distance. We don't let them hover. But most of them don't want to go into that room because they do know people are casting their vote there and they, they respect that privacy. So are observers watching the process from outside the door or are they actually coming into the enclosed space? I don't have observers going into the enclosed okay, space. Okay, I misunderstood that. Okay, yes. thank you. All right. Any, Any other questions? questions for thank you so Ms. much. Thank you very much. Is Ms. Um, Combs here? Yes, she is not here. Okay, thank you. All right, how about Ms. Marks and Mr. DeMillo? Good morning, Chairman Duffy. Thank you, Bruce Brown. Uh, I am representing the respondents in this case and uh, in the following case. The, um, I will address the Argyle Elementary School allegation first. That is the allegation that there were two uh, women, one dark-haired, one lighter-haired. Wait, wait a second. The, we, we need to close. Can somebody close that door? Oops. Sorry. Oh, he just... Oh, he just <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. And can you speak up a little bit? Sure. That's good. Uh, I'll deal with the Argyle Elementary School allegation first, and that is the one where that is against Miss Martin, uh, and she is alleged to have been in the enclosed space, and also next to Miss Marks. Um, the fact that that allegation got to the board as busy as it is in dealing with the crucial uh, matters of Georgia election security, as it has this morning, is of some concern. That allegation is completely false. My clients denied it to the investigator. The investigator undertook a separate investigation to try to find some corroborating evidence, including looking at uh, license plates at Argyle Elementary School, could not find any. And then he says in his investigative report, I couldn't find any evidence that my clients were there. Even though there's no evidence, here we are three years later four years later, dealing with it, with our time, with your time, it must be dismissed. Ms. Marks was in Charlotte, North Carolina at the time. I have, and I will give them to you if you like, a printout showing she was in Charlotte, because it was election day, and she has a Mecklenburg County voter history. We told all of this to the investigator. They were not there, and still for some reason, these people who happen to be also litigants against the state election board, this complaint persists, even with everything we've written about it, to the board. So it needs to be dismissed. Now, the other one. Are you saying that the state election board motivated the investigators to investigate Ms. Marks no. because we're defendants in no. the case? No, but it needs to be dismissed. I understand that. Okay. Now, on the second one, the um, about the enclosed space. 
it's an interesting issue. We've written, I uh, hope you have the, uh, the memo that we wrote on it, but the enclosed, there was no enclosed space at the Watson School, I mean at the Watson Government Center. What the enclosed space is, and this is defined by statute, is the space around the election, around the a barrier around the voting booths. But there's the features of that are that you have to be able to see. It can't be a physical barrier like the one she's describing. What she's describing is the voting room. That's what the law calls the voting room. And you see the pictures of the very big barriers. That's the voting room. That's not the enclosed space. And if you look at the law, as Judge Duffy, you mentioned, first thing to do, just look at the law. The law says the enclosed space is something within the voting rooms. It's not equated with the voting rooms. It also says that the, the enclosed space is, the enclosed space has a guardrail or barrier. There was no guardrail or barrier. Do you, do you agree? I'm sorry to interrupt, but do no, you agree or disagree that those, in your picture, you show the large partitions. Do you agree that or disagree that that's a barrier? It is a barrier, that's the voting room. Okay. And they, in fact, the witnesses themselves refer to that as the voting room. The law refers to an enclosed space as something within the voting room. It's very clear on is that. Is it impossible for the voting room and the enclosed space to be the same thing? It is, because otherwise the laws would make no sense, Your Honor. You're you wouldn't, you wouldn't. Is it possible that the voting room and the enclosed space can be the same space? Or you say you, that the law requires there to be a voting room and that the law, even if it's a small space, you then have to designate some portion of the voting room to be the enclosed space. Two answers to that. One, sort of an academic answer, um, is that it looks like the law of the statute is distinguishing between voting rooms and enclosed space because it says enclosed space is a space within the voting room. Okay, that's the first. That's the first point. And so I would caution if you do provide more, a better description of the enclosed space, that it not be contrary to the statute, which makes that distinction. Okay. However, uh, let, me, a, let me interrupt, interrupt you there on that point. Sure. One, one of the things, if you, if we had a chief justice named Namius, and he was very famous for this formula that I'm about to give you. Um, he's he's retired now, but he was. I read a lot of his opinions. He always said, this. "So if you say the voting room, the enclosed space has to be within the voting room, and you say they can't be the same, what is your definition of within? One inch, one millimeter, one centimeter, one nanometer, ten feet? What's your definition of of the requirement of within?" I don't care. They need to be different, or else the legislature wouldn't have said that they're different. All right, and you're basing it on the fact that they're different by one has a requirement of visibility. And, and one does not. Two things. One is the statute says that the enclosed space is a space within the voting room. Okay. Now, I think a fair reading of that, if, if, if you could read that and say all it says is within, that's not inconsistent with it being the same thing. You could say that. I don't think that's a reasonable interpretation of it. Okay. But the other point, I think it's more important, this is your second point is that the law also provides that it has to, the enclosed space cannot be a, a visibility blocking barrier. And that's the important point. Because as um, the other speaker remarked, it's, it's crucially important for observers and for poll workers and for everybody to be able to observe what's going on in the, in the enclosed space without interrupting the voters. So that's the, that's the point. So the, the way the law is, is it makes a lot of sense. And that is, you've got the voting machines, and then maybe six feet out from that, you have some sort of barrier, but it's not a physical barrier you can see. That's why it says guardrail or barrier. Well, so, let me continue to interrupt you. I'm sorry I keep doing it, but. No, I'll um, answer your question, so that's fine. Traditionally, whenever I was a poll watcher, Every poll watcher I knew always treated the check-in table as the barrier because there was somebody sitting there and you had to get the permission of that someone to go any further. Are you saying that the check-in table cannot be a barrier? Uh, the the, the, the uh, rule um, says enclosed space shall mean 
th that area within a polling space enclosed with a guardrail or barrier, closing the inner portion of such area. So to get back to your question about Justice Namias, enclosing the inner portion of that area would indicate that it is a different area. So that only such persons as are inside such guardrail or barrier can approach within six feet of the ballot box. Okay, so if we have a table, the check-in table, and a person there saying nobody goes past this point, um, and we got to make sure the machines are at least six feet away from that point, um, your argument is that the traditional use of the check-in table is not a sufficient barrier is your argument, right? I, I don't need to make that argument because here the check-in tables was right in the in the middle of the voting room. Are you talking about Argyle or Watson? No, Argyle, we weren't there. I don't know what okay. was at Argyle. Okay. None of our people do because right, they so were talking about there. Watson. Okay. Talking about Watson. And Watson, the check-in room was in the middle of the voting room. Okay. And if that were the barrier, then the voting room itself wouldn't be the barrier. There, the, here, the, here's the thing is that the, it, it, we, there was a big physical barrier that you described. It's about eight feet. It blocked visible access to the voting rooms. It's very clearly a barrier. That, if that is the enclosed space, it clearly violated Georgia law because you have to be able to see the voting machines from the, the members of the public. Uh, that's what the county manager just described, is that the public has to be able to deserve it. Under the law, it's very clear, is that you have a barrier, an enclosed space. Six feet's good, but that doesn't block physical access, and that's within the voting room. You can tell, and, our, and getting back to, getting away from, from sort of the academic, or as, I don't mean academic in, in the sense that it's not important, but just on the interpretation of the no, law. No, it's taken. Yeah. The, the, if you look at what the allegations are in this case, is that, that my clients went into the voting room. Okay, that's what they said. They didn't say in close space. That's what the investigators are putting on top of this. Okay, um, but Coombs and also Hausman said they went into the voting room. They didn't say they went into the enclosed space. It's the investigator that put that gloss on it. There wasn't an enclosed space. In fact, the representative admitted there was no enclosed space because in response to the questions from the board, she said, after this, we started putting up signs or whatever denoting the enclosed space. So there wasn't an enclosed space there. So I understand your argument. Okay. The Mr. Lindsay has a question. And, and I appreciate the, the, the legal back and forth. And, and, and in terms of the long-term figuring out possible rules. Let me ask more factual question. Where exactly were they? They were in the voting room. They were in the voting room? They were in the voting room, uh, Mr. Lindsay. That's fine. I, with, just want to know, I just want to know where exactly they were. But they were in the voting room with members of the press, yeah. with Ms. Hausman, with Steve Fowler. All yeah. of them were there. They were, they are the three that are being prosecuted. The photographer would have been, vi if that was the enclosed space, the photographer would also be a, per uh, yeah. would also be a perpetrator. So the exhibit A would be taken by someone who was a perpetrator, if that was the enclosed okay. space. Okay. It's not the enclosed space. None of them were violating the law. Steve Fowler wasn't violating the law. Liz Hausman wasn't violating the law, and neither were my clients. I'm just, I just want to know physically where they were. Thank you. Appreciate Sorry. that. I, and I heard the rest I did, of the argument. Didn't mean to over uh, answer. No, no, the no. Question. I'm just trying to figure out where exactly they were <laughs> sure. in light of the discussion you had with with uh, yeah. Mr. Thanks. Marshman. And so that's uh, th that is the, the that is our response. But I'll also like to emphasize that there's no, and this is very important. And you heard the nice remarks that she made about Ms. Marks and Dr. DeMello and Ms. Martin. You know Ms. Marks. Richard DeMello, and Richard DeMello is our, one of our main experts in the Curley case. He has been, he is one of the leading experts in the country on cybersecurity. He was praised by, by Judge Totenberg in her opinion that led to the pilot that this was a part of. As a part of the pilot, one big question that Judge Totenberg had was can they do, you, you, heard, the, you heard the difficult process that we're gonna undergo this next time. 
of converting to the next software. Well, when we got the DREs enjoined, the question was, will the state be ready to put in the BMDs? This is back in 2020. Judge Totenberg was very concerned, but one of the things that the Secretary of State said, as you heard today, was they were gonna do a pilot. And Paulding County was one of the pilot locations. That's why everybody was out there, including the expert, our expert, and including Ms. Martin, also an expert, and Ms. Marks. Those were the people that were out there. These are professionals, they're highly respected, and there is no suggestion that they did anything wrong. They didn't touch any of the equipment, they didn't talk to any of the voters, there's no suggestion that they were in any way rude or anything else. And so, um, particularly given the propriety of their actions, the importance of their cause, and the absence of any evidence that they were in an enclosed space, we ask that be dismissed today. And they were there as, a, as an observer, right? They were there as observers. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, would it be appropriate? I want to ask a question to our investigators. Let me just ask one more fact question. Did anybody within your clients take pictures of anything? Um, so, yes, the, um, the panorama that you have in your material, I think was one of our, I think was one of our photos. Taken on the, took, well, taken on the day and, Oh, we, we did. I'm, I'm correct. I thought that was one of ours, but that was that was um, from the Secretary of State's office. So no, answer is no. Thank you. Would that have been okay to, for them to take pictures? Yeah. Can, well, no. It depends anybody, on what it's of. Right. Pardon me. I mean, can anybody who's an observer or a We're, poll watcher take pictures? Uh, part of my part of my my difficulty in answering is the law has changed on photography, and so I don't want to I don't want to comment on that. And we and, and some of some of them are actually being challenged. Some of the laws are being challenged in a separate lawsuit, so I, I don't want right. to speculate well, we've on got, that. Well, the law at the time of this incident, what was it with respect to pictures? I do not know. Okay. I'm sorry. No, I can wait. I just wanted to see whether or not my, my investigators, the, the Secretary of State's investigators, can you confirm that, you know, Mr. Brown has told us that in addition to his clients, there were other individuals there as well, including Ms. Houseman and what were the other ones, Mr. Brown? Mr. Brown, who were the other ones? He said Ms. Houseman. Some reporter and some reporters. Uh, reporters. Were they also at the same place where the Ms. Marks and her group were? From the reports, they were at the location, however, not in the same places that the three individuals were. There's photos of them right near the voting machines. The, they, three, the three individuals were the were, were the Miss Houseman. I don't mean to call her out necessarily, but were those individuals also in the proximate location, sort of in that general location as well? I just trying to figure things out here. He, he's well, one of the things. Let me like, ask him okay, real sorry. quick, and then I'll let sorry, you respond. Sorry. No problem. I just want to. Yeah, you can't you can't discern that from here. But the okay. photos that were taken were of the three individuals that were near the voting machines, very in close proximity within probably, just looking at the photos, maybe a foot of the voting machines, maybe even okay. closer. Is anybody other than the three people in the picture? Okay, this looks like Mrs. Martin by herself in one. Mrs. Marks by herself in another picture. Well, we've not seen those. Could we see those? Show us, just show us the pictures. To, to, be, to clarify, um, photography can be, um, take place in a polling place with, at the discretion of the uh, poll manager. So you'd have to ask permission? Yes. 
while, while persons are voting. Ms. Holden, do you have some pictures too? Since she is a member of the Secretary of State, she would have been permitted because she's considered an election official. Not at that time, though. No. She, she was. I don't, believe, I don't believe she was up at that time. 2019? She was still in the county. Um, she came there with the Secretary of State and was introduced to me as a okay. member of the Secretary of State's office. But she did take the pictures. That's how I knew about it. Um, I did want to show you a picture. Um, that we have um, of the area is that permissible to show you um i guess we're looking at pictures but yours happens to be on a device <laughs> uh well, let us look at these first okay Ask you is this is an exhibit 42 in the file? Is that Mr. Demillo? Uh, yes, Your Honor. And you're looking at things that we, we've we've asked for in advance of this hearing, but but did not get. That is Dr. Demillo. He's here. Can you like. tell me what he's holding in his hand? What does that appear to you to be? Well, looks to me like a cell phone. In fact, there's a little camera up in the uh, yeah. Could have been a cell phone. Um, the to to get back to the allegations. The allegation isn't um, as I think the investigators will confirm is that the violation is not standing too close to a voting machine. That's not the violation that's alleged, right? Instead, it's being in an enclosed space which did not exist. Um, and the photography, I don't know what you're, I don't know what the photographs that, that you're reviewing because we haven't seen them. Well, we'll show them to you in a second. Okay. But um, if you have any other questions, um, I'll, I'll be happy to answer them. Let's show, um, let's show them the pictures we have, that, we, that we've just seen. Chairman Huffy, I, I see no voters in those photos. Photos say, the photos are the photos. What they show, they show. Thank you, pardon? What they show, they show. And we're going to show them to Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown, please. And if you want to step back and show them to Ms. Marks, you can. Uh, let me just check with my client to make sure I got my facts right on this. Okay, okay sure. I do want to mention one thing, Your Honor. Uh, Judge, the uh, page five of seven um, of the photographs, and we need to look at all of them. This is a distorted image um, because what it is is a zoom, is a cro cropped. If you take the, I've seen the, uh, the larger size one of this, and if you look at the normal size of this, you will see about 20 tiles in the floor between Miss Martin and the machines but it's compressed because they've cropped it, as you can do. 
And so they've taken a somewhat accurate photograph and given you a crop that makes it look like she's much closer than she is. So that's troublesome. But more important is they're not, we're not here to defend a charge of violating an election law of standing too close to an election machine because there's no such law. And there's no jurisdiction to enforce a non-existing law. And I don't see a charge. I don't see a charge of standing too close. Right. The charge is being within the enclosed space. Right. And you said there is no enclosed space. I understand the argument. I believe so, and I think that's confirmed by the county's observations as well. Thanks. Well, let me understand. Your, your argument is that because there was no barrier, that, that a, there was everything was the voting room, and that even though people were in there and were able to vote on machines, that there was nowhere in that space that was the enclosed space. That's your legal argument. Yeah, the, the law defines enclosed space. No, I just, I, yeah, that, look, that, is I, the ar that is the argument. Your argument is, in yes, this case, there was no enclosed space, and, and because there wasn't, anybody could go and watch and people vote and stand around machines because that's allowed, because it's only the voting area. The law says you may not go into enclosed space, I, look, look, and that there wasn't one. There wasn't an enclosed you're space. You're saying, and that means that because there was no enclosed space, there was no prohibition from a person going into the voting area and looking at anything they wanted to look at. Yes, Your Honor. In fact, the law says wow. that in the voting room, the public must have access. It's not, it's, not that they, it's not that they got away with doing something that is wrong or should be wrong. It's that they did what the law expressly allows and requires the county to provide. It's, it's, Look, it, I understand your legal argument. I'm just saying, does that mean that if somebody wanted to stand next to a voter and watch them vote because they're only in the polling area, that they could do that? That's a crime, okay? That actually is a crime to do that. Watching somebody vote is a, is a felony. So no, they could not do that. We all did in law school, let's change the facts. Sure. They're not watching the person cast the ballot, but they're inside, they're, they're a foot away from the voter and their back is turned to the voter so they're not watching the voter, but they're watching the environment in which the voter, that's okay with under your definition, right? Because they're not within the enclosed space because there is no enclosed space. I would ask the same question is what law no, no, would that no, no, violate? Look, I mean, this works, he asked you a question, you answer it and then- you Those aren't the question. facts here because there's no picture of a voter. But I'm, I'm just trying to get your definition down. I don't know of what law that would be violating. If, okay. Yeah, if, yeah, if, if, we accept, if we accept your definitions and your argument, we have to also accept that if someone is standing right next to a voter but not watching them vote, they haven't done anything wrong. That has, that's, still, that's the where your argument puts us. No, uh, no it's not. Okay. If the, if the county is doing what it's supposed to do by having an enclosed space, then that should not happen. But in the absence of an enclosed space, it's perfectly fine, the, right? The law, we need to follow the law, not drag it. Um, Okay, the law says that the county is supposed to have, it's, it's not that hard. The law, the, the, the legislature has decided this for us. And the legislature has decided that several things. One, there needs to be enclosed space, which is different than the voting room. Two, that you need to be able to view voters 